Hello and welcome to all to the National Psoriasis Foundation's Healthier Together Whole Body Health. Just a few housekeeping tips before we begin. You'll see a taskbar that looks like this at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and hover if you don't see it and then it should come up. And you can also see who's attending today in the list of participants. And there should also be a chat area for you. Uh, be sure to mute your mic so we don't hear any background noise while the speakers are presenting. And also put, take yourself off of camera. And now for the chat area, make sure you're sending to the right person, whether it's everyone or a specific individual. And then go ahead and type in your message. All questions are placed in the chat. And some of our speakers will pull in questions directly from the chat box. Uh, otherwise, our moderators will do that for you. Now I'd like to turn this over to Audrey Rakes, our Volunteer Services Manager, who will introduce our host for today. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining today. My name is Audrey Riggs. I'm the Volunteer Services Manager for NPF. Again, thank you for joining us today for this important community conference. We are so pleased today to have two outstanding volunteers join us as our host today. I'd like to introduce you to Renee Joyce and Alan Simmons. Alan has been volunteering with NPF since 2014, when he was uh, first introduced to the organization by another volunteer who invited him to a team NPF walk. Alan found the event comforting because he saw people who were having fun and knew exactly what he was going through. He said he found a place of acceptance. Renee is a third year medical student who is diagnosed at age 10 with gutate and plaque psoriasis. At age 16, her psoriasis went from overwhelming to mild with the help of an amazing dermatologist who inspired her to, to pursue a career in medicine. Both Alan and Renee are volunteers with the NPF one-to-one -one mentor program and understand how sharing their experiences and being there for others can be life-changing. We are so pleased to have them as our host today. However, before I hand over that uh, virtual microphone to them, I'd like to advise everyone of a change in our agenda today. Unfortunately, Dr. Brett Ringdahl had an emergency and will not be able to join us today. However, we have the great fortune of having Dr. Tina Butani join us from the University of California, San Francisco to provide the session on sleep and psoriatic disease. So Renee and Alan, take it away. So first off, Carol Ostro is the NPF Board of Directors Chair. She has served on the board since 2012. Carol is the chair of the audit committee and a member of the executive and governance committees at the National Psoriasis Foundation. As long as she can remember, Carol was aware of psoriatic disease as both her mother and older brother suffered from it. Two of Carol's four children also live with the disease. Carol is an independent theater producer in Sag Harbor, New York. She has been an adjunct professor of theater at Vassar College, Chatham College, and McGill University. Ostro holds a BA from Vassar College and an MFA from the Yale School of Drama. Carol is a member of the Board of Trustees of Vassar College, where she chairs the Development Committee and serves on the Yale School of Drama Board of Advisors. She also co-chairs the Board of the Sag Harbor Partnership, a working civic organization dedicated to preserving the natural, historic, and cultural life of this unique American village. And I have the great honor of presenting Leah Howard. She is the president and CEO of the National Psoriasis Foundation. She has more than two decades of experience working with national health and disability organizations, local governments, and leading healthcare and research institutions. Leah has lived with psoriasis for 21 years and has positioned the NPF as a leading voice in the efforts to measure value and reflect patient preferences and health outcomes. Leah believes that solving today's healthcare challenges begins with talking to individuals living with chronic diseases like psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Over the last decade, Leah has empowered people with psoriatic disease to share their challenges with policymakers at the state and federal level, as well with regulators and health, ag health agency management. This led to a number of improvements for the community, including more than 40 new state laws improving access to treatment. Leah has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Government and International Relations from the University of Notre Dame, 
and a law degree from George Mason University School of Law. Leah is based at the NPF headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. I think Carol's going to kick us off. I am, and thank you um, for my lovely introduction as well. So on behalf of the NPF Board of Directors, including some of my colleagues who are joining us today, I'm really here to say welcome to the final 2023 NPF Community Conference, and I appreciate you all being here. Um, my name is Carol Ostro, and it is also my honor to be the chair of the NPF Board of Directors. As part of the NPF director, Board of Directors for more than a decade, it has really been a pleasure to support this organization as it's grown and as we push the boundaries in advancing the health and knowledge of psoriatic disease. Like many of you, and as was said in the introduction, I have lived with psoriatic disease um, as a part of my family for as long as I can remember. My mother had psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, as did one of my older brothers. So I grew up with the smell of tar in my house. But it really wasn't until almost 30 years later when my eldest daughter came home from college with a patch that I immediately recognized and knew was psoriasis that I encountered psoriasis, I call it psoriasis 2.0. So for those of you who are suffering and or for those of you who are parents, I'm sure you can relate. Um, but when your child is, is suffering, you'll do whatever it takes to find the answers to help them. And even though we eventually found an amazing physician, I still had so many questions, also like all of you. And as our physician said, you need to be a part of the NPF because NPF is the organization serving individuals living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So it didn't take too long for my entire family to be involved. And I'm glad to be here with you, still asking questions and still learning today. So the theme for today's conference is healthier together, whole body health. This theme, whole body health leads me to think of the NPF strategic plan, which as you may know, put an emphasis on supporting the whole health of individuals living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. I've had the honor of being on the committee that developed that plan five years ago. And one of our commitments was to build a plan that recognized that when you live with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, you are challenged by much more than the disease that manifests on your skin and in your joints. So today's theme speaks to the significant burden of living with the diagnosis of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So as we kick off the conference, I wanted to reflect just for a moment on NPF as we race towards the end of 2023. It's an incredibly exciting time for our organization. As I said, we're in the final year of our current five-year strategic plan, and we're already working on the plan that will guide the organization for the next five years. And I just want to share some of the exciting developments at the foundation in recent months. In September, NPF started the third year of a third-year grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention focused on disease education and awareness among communities that are underserved and under-resourced. In July, NPF announced over $3 million in research grants and fellowships. And just last month, we had an amazing three days of scientific sessions as part of our research symposium, the 25th annual residence meeting and the first ever rheumatology fellows meeting. So I know from working with Leah, who is a terrific CEO and president, that she shares my enthusiasm for about this moment for the NPF. It's going to be her turn in a moment, but I just want to conclude by, by welcoming and expressing how much we appreciate all of you joining us today and how much we learn from your questions and from your experiences. So please stay engaged. We appreciate your engagement with the NPF. We're standing by, stay with us and thank you. Great, thank you, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Alan and Renee um, for the introductions of the two of us. I really wanna just echo 
Carol's welcome, first of all, um, to each of you for joining us today. I heard Bev sharing some of the places folks were dialing in from, and we truly have an international crowd. I know we had over 200 people register for this program today, and so we're thrilled to be bringing you, as Carol said, this opportunity to engage with the leading experts in the field, listen to updates on psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, ask questions, and get more information to help you on your journey to better health. As Carol shared, this conference theme so resonates with our current strategic plan. And, and as Carol talked about in terms of the work that we have going on right now, so much of what we do every day is really guided by listening. I'm glad Alan shared how passionate I am about listening to the community because truly at the NPF, that's what we've been doing for the last five decades, whether it's through our annual survey, or our programs where we get to connect with individuals in our community and hear your questions and understand what's challenging you. That really guides how we approach the creation of new programs, development of initiatives, and the stories that we tell policymakers about what's needed to get our community to a place where your psoriasis and your psoriatic arthritis are better managed. So as Carol said, please keep reaching out, please keep asking questions, and we look forward to supporting you each step of the way in your journey. As we go through today, please open up the chat function that Bev directed you to. You'll get lots of information there. I love seeing the welcomes that people have put in the chat. I saw just a moment ago, a fellow member of the board of directors with Carol Macabellica welcomed people from uh, Richmond where he's located. So you'll see some names, maybe if you've come before that you know, but please, if you're new, feel free to jump in and engage and ask questions. NPF staff is on the line. Most of us have NPF after our name and we'll be dropping links and sharing information in the chat with you as questions get asked. Our goal here today is really to direct you to additional resources and tools that will help you on your journey to better health. So please feel free to pop things in the chat and we will circle back after the meeting too with all of those same links. So don't feel like if you missed a link um, that you really wanted to capture, this is your one and only shot to get that information. So welcome and we look forward to kicking off. I have promised we will stay on track. So my next job is to introduce our Chief Scientific and Medical Officer, Dr. Guy Eakin. Uh, Guy joined us just a few months ago, and I'm thrilled to have him as a member of the NPF team. Dr. Eakin provides the vision, leadership, and overall management of the mission-related efforts in both research and medical affairs here at the National Psoriasis Foundation. In fact, he's responsible for overseeing all the activities that we undertake in research, whether that's the $3 million in research funding that Carol talked about us releasing this summer, the research efforts conducted here at the MPF, like our annual survey, or any of the programs where research is shared, like the research symposium um, that we held just this past, um, earlier this month, a few weeks ago here in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, Guy came to us, uh, as I said, just a few months ago, but before joining the NPF, he led more than 139 million in research programs at the Arthritis Foundation and Lipedema Foundation and the Bright Focus Foundation. These programs led to novel biomarker development and drug discovery efforts, in addition to the creation of a 30,000 person home-based patient reported outcomes program. Dr. Egan's opinions and interviews have been published in numerous prominent media outlets. He earned his PhD in developmental biology from Baylor College of Medicine before continuing that work at MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centers. Outside of his work, he can be found keeping up with his incredible wife and two children or enjoying the trails and waterways near his home in Maryland. So welcome, Guy. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so uh, I am indeed Guy Eakin, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. You know, you are going to hear today just a, a wealth of clinical and research data. But in this research update, I'd like to go a little bit back to our basics. We're, we're all interested in what's, what is the cutting edge? What is, what is the right way of treating, you know, all the sleep, the diet, and nutrition, pain, 
But let's go back a moment and look at our mission and ask what it is that we do when we create a research program. What are the reasons we create that program and how do we actually execute on it? Suffice it to say, I, I already had a lovely introduction, but I, I've had about 17 years in the nonprofit community and I've, I've waited about 17 years to come to an organization that is structured to make a difference and then also has this amazing history of doing so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history coming up in just a moment. But when we think about research, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but what does it mean to our researchers? We all know that the National Psoriasis Foundation is the leading nonprofit funder for psoriatic disease research. But you know, one of the things that drew me to this organization is as I looked around the community, it's the only organization that has a very specific plan that's developed to defeat psoriatic disease. And as generated, we can talk about the dollar values, but let's let's talk about the history. It has generated this tremendous legacy of impact such that I can stand before you today and I can tell you that the treatments that you are receiving are likely to have been influenced by NPF research. And anything you see over there on that left-hand side of the screen has either been funded, you know, at the discovery stage, at the clinical trial stage, or the NPF has committed funding to understanding how best to deliver these, these therapies in, in our clinical populations. And so that is just an absolutely tremendous level of impact for an organization that has only been funding research since about 1987. And so when we get when we drill down just another level on what what it means to have an impact in our in our research communities is that the unit of currency by which researchers talk to one another are the publications. And so, you know, we can talk and we can have these wonderful symposium or committee meetings that we come together and talk about what it is that is really going to define where our community should go. But the history of psoriatic disease research is written by these publications. And so there are since, you know, just in the last little over a decade, there have been more than 2,200 at this point publications that each of them represent a novel insight on psoriatic disease that have been made possible by the awards programs of the National Psoriasis Foundation. And when we actually ask the question of, well, are they, that's great that they're out there, but are they making a difference? We can look at the clinical trials that are out there in our community and see the way that they incorporate the data produced by the National Psoriasis Foundation into their understanding of those clinical trials, such that we have about 400 clinical trials that have actually leveraged the National Psoriasis Foundation supported research in order to create these new therapies that we all rely on. If that's how researchers talk to each other, you know, how do we inside the National Psoriasis Foundation think about our role in research and medical affairs? And so how I talk to my team is that our our role is to ensure that every patient in our community is receiving evidence-based care. And so the way we typically think about, about research is that new evidence generation. That's, that's the scientist in the laboratory working on experiments, generating data, getting them into those publications. And so there's actually another part of that. That's actually taking our thought leadership, working with groups of our, our thought leaders in our medical and research community to also evaluate the evidence as we create that data. How do we come together and ask the question of taken all together, what story is that data telling us? What direction does that mean for research? What the direction does that mean for clinical care? And examples of what that looks like are things like our clinical guidelines that your, your dermatologist and your other specialty providers are being trained on is what, it, what is the standard of care for treating psoriatic disease? We also, when things don't show up in our, in our clinical guidelines, we also take special opportunities to evaluate the data that informs care around things like emerging topics, like you can see on the board here, telemedicine became very important to all of us in the last, in the last five years with the pandemic, as well as the, uh, you know, questions, you know, that, that look at where we are today in terms of the development of our, our research sophistication 
such that we can actually have conversations now about what it might mean to put psoriasis into remission. In order to do that, we need to have good definitions of what re remission is. So we work with our clinical and patient com and research communities to actually convene that leadership to not only generate data, but to do the evaluation and then get it out into our, into our communities. You know, when we talk about data generation, you know, we just don't, we don't just go out there and explore, you know, for the sake of exploration, it all begins with a question. And, you know, without going into too much detail, we're really interested right now on the diagnosis and prognosis of psoriatic disease. So how do we find out who has psoriatic disease as early, early, early as possible? That's the diagnosis. That's the diagnosis side. And then the prognosis is if you imagine a person who is who goes untreated, who are going to be the people who are going to have positive outcomes or negative outcomes? And at what time, under what time frame, who are going to be the people when we think about prediction who are going to respond to a specific therapy? How do we incorporate the ideas of genetics or environmental factors into, into our understanding of what is going to make a future for them that is the that it that involves the most positive outcomes? So where do these questions come from? Well, you know, to be honest, you know, this is the community conference. It comes from our community and specifically from our patient community. We have lots of different tools. I will tell you right now, I will be influenced today by the questions that you put into the chat room. But we have other tools that are more formalized ways of tuning our antenna to the, to the questions that come up from our patient community. And I, one that I wanna highlight for you is our annual survey. If you, uh, I, I really wanna encourage you, if you haven't participated in this in the past, to be on the lookout for the invitations that come to you, asking you to, to participate. Find some time, find 30 minutes to an hour to sit down and, and, and fill out this survey. It's going to ask you questions about how psoriasis or psoriatic disease inter intersects with your life. What is the impact of the disease? What is the impact of treatment? You know, think about the comorbidities or the symptoms, like how does it, uh, how does sleep factor into your life with psoriatic disease? How do you manage the pain? What are our, our differences in, in the different types of psoriatic disease that are out there, whether you might have plaque psoriasis or GPP, you know, et cetera. That happens you know, right about this time of year every year. And that data goes into a group of, a group of experts that look at the data and then publish research reports based on that data. And then that those research reports, I'm here to tell you that a lot of those surveys that you see out there in the world go into an organization and they get shared around amongst the, the leadership teams or amongst the, the program teams, but they don't make it actually into having an effect in the community. This annual survey data really does go on to be used by researchers, by our drug development partners. It's used by our advocacy team and our, in those efforts to convince employers or insurance about what it really means to actually make a change and have forward momentum on making lives better for people with psoriatic disease. So you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, here's an example of some learnings that were just, uh, just published. You know, it, it questions the idea of what it means to have a certain level of severity for, uh, for psoriatic disease. And so there are definitions used in, in clinical trials, you know, historically, that as we get more sophisticated in research, we'd like to start thinking about a more sophisticated approach to severity. And so what we've heard from the patient community is, yes, I might have psoriatic disease evidence on maybe one to 3% of my body, but for instance, if that happens to be in a high impact site, like the palm of the hands, you know, scalp, genitals, well, then that's a more severe condition. And so trying to take that, that obser those observations and then turn them into measurements that we can use to actually 
create objective measures of severity of the disease is a very important contribution to the field. So again, really encourage anybody out there to, to look, be on the lookout for those annual surveys. The invitations typically come by, by email about this time of year. We have other, uh, other examples of observations that are coming out of that, that program on the right-hand side of the screen. So now that we're starting to develop questions about the research program, we develop structure that asks us when we think about how we fund research that's out there amongst our research community, how do we take that, how do we take that, those questions and create different, different funding mechanisms to make sure that we're, we're dividing the dollars in our community again into the places where we think there's going to be the most impact. So you will see that we have discovery awards, which this is the researchers who are working in the darkness that are really discovering the things that are, you know, absolutely revolutionary to how we think about the disease. We have translational awards that once those, once those discoveries are made, that we start moving them into the direction of how do we use them as levers to pull in clinical practice? How do we create new drugs about them? We have a contribution to to our uh, understanding of how how psoriatic disease uh, works with the comorbidities that we know travel with psoriatic disease, and what are the molecules that cause these these diseases to work together? And then one of the things that I think you know beyond just the data that come out of our psoriatic disease research is our workforce development contributions through our research programs. So if we could, if we look just at the clinical care of psoriatic disease, what you're seeing here is controlled for population. We all know that most of the population is sort of on the coast of our country, but if we control for that, there are enormous swaths of the country represented in yellow here that have zero dermatologists per 100,000 population. So if you translate that into what that means for a research community is that Clinical trials are not happening. The places where we recruit patients into clinical trials are not happening in anything colored yellow, you know, here. And, it, and it, uh, it, this workforce issue with like the scarcity of people focused on psoriatic disease is also a problem in the research community. And so we, we use our awards to change that too. One of the things that we do is we really use our research programs to lead other funding programs into investing in psoriatic disease. It is true that anytime a researcher goes and pitches an idea about psoriatic disease research in, in front of major funding agencies, they are in competition with literally every other disease out there. So if, if we can help them secure some uh, initial preliminary findings, that makes them more competitive for that downstream investment. So if you take, for example, something like our bridge grant program, that has almost a 750% nearly eightfold follow on return on investment. So that means that if we've invested about $850,000 into the re in recent years into the research in our bridge grant program, those investigators have parlayed that initial investment from us to catalyze more than $6.3 million in downstream funding through, uh, through organizations like the NIH. And that's, that's where we move from sort of thinking about just like funding the best ideas out there to also leading the field and making it possible to be the rising tide that floats all ships and develops this very important workforce. I'll give you an example of an individual case study where this is where this is happening. You can rewind, you know, our timelines to 2011, and we gave a $75,000 discovery grant to to look at a specific molecule in animal models. With success, it took about nine years, but we turned that you know turned that into a little bit of extra seed money, two hundred thousand dollars, to go on and uh, and develop a little bit of extra extra data that allows the translation of these initial discoveries into uh, conceptualization of what a new a new intervention leveraging the, these molecules would look like. That just recently received. $4 million total in NIH funding to support phase two clinical trials in a 12 year period, which tells us like research is a long process, but the NPF is really doing the right thing, catalyzing that downstream funding and keeping psoriatic disease on the table and competitive.
I won't say too much about this, but when, when you ask about the scale of our research programs, I can tell you that we have more than 60 projects that are currently being managed right now. And as, as Carol alluded to earlier, we gave, we had uh, 27 projects just announced new in, in, in this year. Uh, they're spread over all sorts of different topic areas, but I want to take the remainder of my talk to just focus on two of or two or three of those projects just to give you a sense of like what we're getting excited about and what the data that we see tends to look like. So the, the two classes of projects I'm gonna talk about are how we, how we are looking at biomarkers and, and diagnostic test tools for psoriatic arthritis. And then another project that is looking at prevention of burden of disease in, in psoriatic disease patients, specifically around the cardiovascular comorbidities. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a, just a moment. So let's talk first about those diagnostic tests for psoriatic arthritis. So I'm going to talk about two different projects, one for Dr. Chandra in the University of Toronto and one Dr. Sher in New York University. And so the the projects that we're talking about, it says confidential, but it's now been presented, you know, presented outside, you know, is, is basically saying that when we look at a panel of, of biomarkers of different molecules that exist in the body, that we can start to see who is most likely to convert to psoriatic arthritis. And so what we, uh, what we're seeing here is that the FDA has defined this type of this type of, of uh, graph or, or research report as a way that they assess the quality of the biomarkers and how predictive they are of a particular disease. And what you want to see is that the, is that the best markers are going to be ones where that line trends all the way to that upper left-hand corner, which means that the work that we're getting out of this laboratory is considered using the rubric that the FDA uses as being amongst the most excellent in quality. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this, but you know, when we look at that type of work where we're getting really strong predictive value out of our PSA tests, we can also look at the other projects. So this is Dr. Scherer's work at New York University, which was just published in April of this year. And shorthanding a lot of uh, a lot of data, they're looking very carefully at nearly individual cells, all the genes that are being expressed in these individual cells, and they're making some really surprising you know, conclusions. Maybe not surprising to a patient community, but documenting for a research community that a psoriatic plaque existing on your skin has a certain genetic profile to it. And if you look at things that you think might be unaffected areas of the body, you also see similar genetic changes, reminding us that the psoriatic disease plaque is just a, it's the canary in the coal mine. It's, ju it's just there to remind us that something is going on all over the body where there is an inflammation that is smoldering. And that if we're going to treat, especially in the moderate to severe stages of the disease, if we're going to treat the psoriatic disease, we really need to be focusing not just on the plaque, but across the whole body, even areas that we think might not be uh, otherwise affected. And so, I want to turn attention for a second to Dr. Gelflin's work at the University of Pennsylvania. And we, this has been published recently in conference abstracts. And what we're doing here is asking the question of, you know, sometimes we think of research as just designing drugs, you know, and there's a question of what, what is our goal? Our goal is to limit the burden of disease. So are there other ways that we can limit the burden of disease beyond developing a new medication or a new medical treatment? And one of the ways that we're thinking about that is to ask the question of, when you go to see a dermatologist, you are not seeing a cardiologist. And sometimes patients fall between the cracks on the transition to a cardiology, cardiology care. So if we, under, if we just accept that that is a problem in our community, an intervention that we can do is to create coordinated care that actually helps link a dermatology patient to appropriate cardiology care when indicated. So in this case, we've had a phase one study that used a clinical coordinator to follow up on dermatology 
visits receive cardiology related laboratory information from the patient work with the patient when indicated to establish appropriate cardiology care and then ensure that that cardiology information travels back to the uh, dermatologist assuring that there's a complete full spectrum care happening for that individual patient and in that pilot study what we saw is that about 25 percent of the patients who went through this program were, were underdiagnosed for their cardiovascular risk and benefited from this from this linkage to the uh, to the cardiology programs. So with success in that phase one study, we're now moving on to a phase two study that will expand the program to be more than you know more than 130 uh, 130 patient encounters across on, almost 20 different different clinical sites. So I don't have much time today. I don't want to stand between you and the, and the rest of the, the conversations. But I, what I'd like to show you is uh, how, how to get in touch. So you can look at some of the things I said on our website, in our, in our award profiles. We have newsletters you know, that go out where you can find out what's new in the research community. But we also have a very new social media presence on, on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, but also that information is flowing into our LinkedIn accounts and other social media platforms. So you can look for us on Twitter at MPF Pro. And of course, all of the staff are always eager to help. So that's the end of my talk, and I'll turn it back over to the conference organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those fascinating and important updates. It was really enjoyable to listen to, and I'm sure everyone else feels the same. So for our next segment, we're going to have Dr. Bhutani. So here today to provide a better understanding of just how important our sleep is to our overall health is Dr. Bhutani. She's a dermatologist and clinical researcher in the Department of Dermatology at UCSF. She serves as a co-director of the Psoriasis and Skin Treatment Center, a world-renowned clinic dedicated to the care of patients with psoriasis. Her clinical expertise includes the treatment of complex, treatment-resistant cases of inflammatory skin diseases using unique combinations of topical agents, systemic treatments, biologics, and phototherapy. She also directs the Dermatology Clinical Research Unit, where she utilizes her advanced training and clinical research methods to oversee numerous sponsored and investigator-initiated clinical studies. She is currently the PI for six clinical trials, developing new therapeutics or diagnostics for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, and alopecia areata. Her research thus far has been focused on assessing and improving quality of life and mental health in patients with psoriasis by treating their skin disease effectively. She now would like to expand upon this focus and look for methods to decrease the stress burden of psoriasis and improve patient well-being in the hopes of improving quality of life in a new and unique way. Nutrition, exercise, sleep, social connectedness, and mindfulness are the five pillars known to increase overall wellness in both healthy and diseased patients. Over her career, she hopes to look further into each of these aspects and their importance in inflammatory skin disease starting with a research program focusing on sleep and psoriasis and its impact on disease severity, mental health, and cardiometabolic comorbidities. So warm welcome to Dr. Bhutani. We are so excited to have you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Renee, for that really kind introduction. I'm really excited to he be here today and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the impact of sleep on uh, psoriatic disease. Um, we've been doing a lot of work here at UCSF related to this, so I'm excited to, to talk to you more about this. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant for the, for the talk today. Okay, so today we're first going to talk about why is sleep important just in general for our general health. Um, we're going to talk about consequences of sleep deprivation, so what happens if you're not getting enough sleep, especially over long periods of time. Finally, because we're, we're here for the NPF um, conference, we're going to talk about sleep and its impact on psoriasis. And then finally, we're going to talk about future directions and research that we're doing here at UCSF to further study um, the connection between sleep and psoriasis. So my guess is that over the last three to five years, if we were in a live room and I asked everybody to, to raise their hand, um, how many of you have 
either read an article, seen something on TV, heard a podcast, you know, something about um, the the uh, impact of sleep. Yeah, I already see a few hands in the in the audience. Um, everywhere you look, there are sleep trackers. You know, your Apple Watch, your your Fitbit. Um, people are really kind of you know really obsessed with sleep at this point in time. Um, there's lots of books being written, and the the mattress industry in the U.S., which I think is a is a crazy statistic, is a fifty billion dollar industry <laughs> at this current point in time. So people are really really um, understanding the importance of sleep, and that's because many are calling this the the sleep revolution. But what's really interesting is that up until just a few years ago, maybe in the 1950s or 60s. People who actually um, um, focused on sleep were either labeled as being lazy or unmotivated, or we have these terms like you snooze, you lose, or I can sleep when I'm dead. But it really wasn't until the advent of sleep medicine in the 1950s when we really started to learn about why is sleep important? Um, again, what are the consequences if we don't get enough sleep? And so that is based on that research, um, that's why we're seeing this, this huge resurgence in, in um, a focus on sleep. So sleep serves a lot of really critical functions. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few important ones here today. So one is memory formation. There's actually been lots of studies to show that if someone's not getting sleep, you actually can't form long-term memories. I think about sleep as almost um, when we're sleeping, it's kind of like when, um, when files are going from your local desktop and being uploaded into the cloud, which is your long-term memory. Um, and without sleep, you, you actually can't form those long-term memories um, and you won't be able to recall things um, later on when you're, when you're asked to, to recall them. But just as important as um, a declarative memory or, or, you know, our thoughts and memories is immune memory. And we know that without sleep, we actually also can't have a highly functioning immune system. Um, and again, lots of studies have shown that through, um, if, if someone is not sleeping adequately, their immune system is not functioning um, at its peak performance. Um, I love this study because this kind of proves this. So this was a study done by one of my colleagues here at UCSF, Eric Prather, who's a very prominent sleep researcher. And he actually looked at response to vaccines based on how much sleep someone was getting the night before. Um, and so um, they took people and they gave them the hepatitis B vaccine and they, they separated them by how much sleep they were getting prior to getting the vaccine. As it, and as you can see, the people who are getting less than six hours of sleep had the least response to that vaccine, whereas the patients who were getting greater than seven hours of sleep were, were had higher responses. It's this perfect dose-response relationship, we call it. He did a very similar study with the flu vaccine and showed that the most important nights were the first two nights before getting their flu vaccine in order to optimize, uh, um, optimize response to that vaccine. So I think these beautifully show um, the impact of sleep on that immune response and how important it is. Um, the other thing that sleep is important for, it's actually during sleep when our brain um, clears out metabolic waste. So during the day, you know, our brain is functioning. It's actually creating a lot of byproducts, you know, a lot of extra um, uh, chemicals and things that we actually don't need. And if those were to um, accumulate over time could cause problems. And there's studies that show now that, um, that it's during sleep that a lot of that metabolic waste is actually cleared out. Um, we have these specialized lymph vessels called the glymphatic system that enlarge and the flow through those lymph vessels increases during sleep to kind of just wash out your brain. Um, I think of this like running the dishwasher at night. This is what I usually do, right? I fill up all the dishes and then I wash them in the middle of the night. Um, and I think that's also what's, you know, going on, going on in our brain. So another really important function of sleep. But what are consequences of insufficient sleep? Now, we, there's actually both short-term consequences and there's long-term consequences. And I'm going to talk about both a little bit today. So first, let's talk about short-term consequences. Now, we've always heard, you know, if you don't sleep enough, you're going to get sick, you're going to catch a cold, right? We, we've heard this, you know, from our families, from our neighbors. Um, and this was another study by Dr. Prather, which actually proved that this might actually be true. Now, I don't know how he got this research approved, but what he did is he took patients and he actually kept them in kind of a hotel setting um, for a course of a week and he manipulated their sleep. So he made sure that, you know, some patients were getting less than five hours, some were getting five to six, and then others were getting adequate sleep less than seven hours. And then what he did is he actually went in and he injected the cold virus into, into their noses and exposed them to the cold virus. 
And, um, and then he followed them for the next few days to see who actually developed a, an objective cold. Um, and as you can see, the patients who are getting less than five hours or less than six hours of sleep were more likely to actually develop that cold versus the patients that were getting greater than seven hours of sleep. So I think that's really fascinating. Again, showing that connection between sleep and the immune system, and even as little as one week of sleep, um, making an impact on your susceptibility to getting, getting an infection. Sleep loss also makes us more reactive to stress. So this was a study on the left here. This graph shows um, they took patients and they actually exposed them to a stressor and they looked at their, their cortisol, which is a sign of how, how stressed they basically got after that exposure. And um, the bottom line, or actually the dashed line, is good sleepers, so people who are getting good sleep. And then the top line is people that were getting poor sleep. And as you can see, the people who are getting poor sleep were more likely to actually react to that stress versus um, people who were getting who were getting active sleep. And I think we can all relate to that, right? When you're when you're tired, when you're <laughs> you're cranky, um, you're you're more likely to respond to things in your life versus if you're well rested. Um, I thought what was really interesting is that the what would, they were more most likely to respond to were actually the low level stressors. So when they were exposed to high level stresses, they actually did okay. But when it was the low level things, when it was those little things like forgetting your keys or you know not being able to find your phone, um, those are the things that set people off. And so so that was the really interesting finding of this study as well. And I think any of us who have been around a sleep deprived toddler could tell you that. Um, Sleep loss can can lead to emotional reactivity, and there's been lots of studies here to show that um, when somebody is not sleeping well, their brain centers that are linked to emotional reactivity light up um, and and cause kind of greater emotional responses than maybe we would like when when we're well rested. Um, and finally, sleep and accidents. So, um, you know, sleep is really important. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates drowsy driving to be responsible for an annual average of 83,000 crashes a year, and 886 of those are actually fatal. So um, this is really, really an important consequence that can impact any of us, right, without us even knowing. Um, they estimate that being awake for at least 18 hours is the same as someone having a blood alcohol level as a 0.05. So basically, we're drunk driving when we're when we're not actively sleeping. And historically, a lot of the um, the most uh, the the greatest accidents in in history actually have all, all been linked back to sleep deprivation, whether it be the the Exxon Valdez or um, or any of these other. Um, accidents, they, um, the, the investigations have shown in the end that most of the people that were responsible were, were sleep deprived. Okay, so what about the long term? So I talked about short term, right? Even 18 hours of sleep can influence someone's driving ability, but what about in the long term? So when we look at chronic sleep loss, if someone is not sleeping well over long periods of time, they actually are more likely to be obese. Um, this graph over here on the right shows that um, that patients who are sleeping six hours or seven hours of sleep um, are actually more likely to have a higher body mass index or higher weight than um, someone that was sleeping sleeping adequately eight or nine hours. Now you can see this is kind of a U-shaped curve, which I thought was interesting at first. So it seems like the people who are you know sleeping between seven and eight hours have the have the lowest BMI. Um, and we think this happens because if you're sleeping too much, eight or nine, 10 hours at night, you're probably not sleeping well. You're probably waking up a lot in the middle of the night. Your sleep is probably very fragmented. So that's why sometimes these these um, curves look U-shaped. It's the people that are getting low amounts of sleep are, are having the bad consequences, but also people that are getting too much sleep, but that's probably because their sleep quality just isn't so good. Um, the interesting thing is also not only are these patients have a have a higher BMI, but the sleep restriction also increases their desire to eat foods that are high in sugar and fat content. And so again, I think again we can all relate to this. If you're sleep deprived, you start to crave these kind of unhealthy foods, and again, this just becomes um, a vicious cycle. We see a very similar curve for diabetes. So patients who are getting low amounts of sleep are more likely to develop insulin dependent diabetes um, or or poor quality sleep. And then this is a lot of numbers on this slide, but basically a very similar trend for cardiovascular disease. So patients who are sleeping less than five hours um, or six um, hours a night are more likely to develop things like um, heart, heart attacks and cardiovascular disease compared to someone who's, who's sleeping eight hours a night. 
And then we know the connection between sleep and mood disorders. Um, sleep loss is actually one of the criteria that we use to diagnose depression and mental health disorders. But there's also studies now in adolescents that show that if people are not sleeping um, at young ages, they're actually more likely to develop mental health disorders later on in life. So again, another, another vicious, vicious cycle. And then again, because I'm a dermatologist, I have to talk about sleep quality and skin health. Um, studies have shown that people who get good sleep are actually objectively, when people are rating their ages, they actually look younger <laughs> if they're if they're getting um, good amounts of sleep. And they're actually, it's easier for their skin to recover um, to trauma, basically. So when we look at something like transepidermal water loss, what we're looking at is basically we're damaging the skin um, and looking at how well it heals. And we can do the same thing by exposing the skin to to sunlight. And so the studies have shown that good sleepers are more uh, um, heal faster when exposed to those, those traumas um, compared to, to patients who are, who are poor sleepers. And so for all of these reasons, the American Academy of Sleep and Medicine has said that adults should be sleeping seven or more hours per night. That sounds easy, right? But the reality is, is that's not what's happening. Um, the CDC, um, sorry, uh, the data shows that 35% of U.S. adults are not getting the recommended seven hours of sleep each night. And I think what's even more terrifying is that six out of 10 middle schoolers and seven out of 10 high schoolers are also not getting adequate sleep. And, you know, they're in their formative years, right, when we're, when, you know, the, um, Basically, their bodies are developing. And so, you know, thinking about those consequences of long-term sleep, um, I think that's super important. And for all of those reasons, the CDC has listed insufficient sleep as a public health epidemic. We also see disparities when it comes to sleep, unfortunately, like many things that we in our in our healthcare system. And so what we see is that non-white populations um, are more likely to not get the seven hours of sleep compared to white populations. And the farther someone is from the um uh, uh, the poverty line, um, or I should say below the poverty line, uh, they're also more likely to be getting less sleep. And this graph you can see here um, shows the darker brown um, it are the areas where patients are more likely to be getting inadequate sleep. And you can see it's large parts of the South, place, um, areas of the U.S. where we have more populations with skin of color um, and also uh, lower socioeconomic status. So this is this is a big problem. All right, so let's talk a little bit about sleep and psoriasis. Um, now, how did I become interested in this? This is my patient, um, a real patient of mine. He was basically um, a textbook patient with psoriasis. He had 20 years history of severe psoriasis. He had psoriatic arthritis, and he had a lot of those same comorbidities that Guy just talked about in his last talk, but he was obese. He had hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He'd been diagnosed with liver disease. He'd had a heart attack a few years prior. Um, so he could, you know, he, he checked all the boxes of the things that we worry about for our patients with psoriasis. In addition, he had really hard to treat psoriasis. Um, he had been actually referred to me um, by an outside dermatologist, having tried and failed a couple of different drugs. And I would love to say that he came to me and I was able to find the perfect combination of things to clear his skin. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. But he stuck with me and I followed him for years and we, we kept on trying. But one day he came in and this is what his foot looked like. And not to say he's clear by any means, this was definitely still active. But he was able to walk. He was able to function. What I didn't show you is his hands also look the same. And he was a guitar player. And so he was once again able to play the guitar and, and do the things that he loved. And so I asked him, I said, you know, what changed? We didn't really change anything to your treatment. Like, what, what happened? And so the interesting thing is he said, he said, Dr. Butani, all I did was stop sleeping with my wife. And so first I got with a little <laughs> thrown back. I was like, what, what's going on? But, um, but it turns out that his wife had been diagnosed with sleep apnea, and because she was now being sleeping with a big CPAP machine, they decided to start sleeping in different rooms. And unbeknownst to him for the past many, many years, because of his wife's sleep apnea and her waking up multiple times in the middle of the night, he was also waking up multiple times in the middle of the night. And once they started to sleep in separate rooms, he now started to get that good sleep quality. And lo and behold, his skin started to improve. And he told me, he said, Dr. Butani, you need to study this. <laughs> um, and he actually brought in that book that I showed you on the first slide, Why, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Um, and so I got intrigued and I started reading the book um, and I and I started to, to look into the literature about what had been published with sleep and psoriasis. What I did know was that there was an association with psoriasis and obstructive sleep apnea. This is a bidirectional association. So patients with psoriasis are more likely to have sleep apnea, but also patients with sleep apnea are also more likely to have psoriasis. 
So I had heard about this and I knew about this association. But I think what was really interesting from reading Dr. Walker's book and doing more research is that many of the comorbidities, just like I told you, um, that are associated with psoriasis are also associated with sleep loss. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, different types of cancers. But I wondered why nobody was not talking about this. There had been no other research um, looking to see if sleep could be a modifying factor in, in patients with psoriasis to see, you know, is this influencing the development of their comorbidities or is this making their disease harder to treat as is the case with my patients? So there was a few studies that had been that had been done, not a lot, but a few studies. This was a Taiwanese study. And basically what they showed is they took psoriasis patients and they separated them into patients who were sleeping well and patients who weren't sleeping well. And what they found was is that the patients who were not sleeping well were, had a significantly higher risk of ischemic heart disease or stroke compared to psoriasis patients who were sleeping well. So again, this was a small study from one country, but a really important finding, I think, to help um, reiterate that sleep could be a modifying factor um, in that pathway from psoriasis to cardiovascular disease. This was really interesting too. Um, this was a, a study that looked at the nurses health study, which is a very large scale study looking at nurses over a long period of time. And since you know many nurses are night shift workers, they found they were able to find that um, compared to those who reported no night shift work, those who are working night shifts had a significantly increased risk for even developing psoriasis. So, you know, could sleep loss be one of the triggering factors um, in, in even unlocking those genes and making someone present, present with psoriasis? This was a study that we did um, here at UCSF using data from, from the National Psoriasis Foundation, a data set called the Citizen Scientist Cohort. Um, and what we found is, um, is that psoriasis patients are not sleeping well. So um, about 60% of psoriasis patients in that survey reported some type of trouble sleeping. Um, and about 40% of those uh, patients said that they were sleeping less than seven hours a day. Um, this um, sleep, sleep disturbance was associated with the severity of their psoriasis. So the more severe their psoriasis was, the more likely they were to have the sleep disturbance. And it was also associated with things like psoriatic arthritis, uh, female gender, having a higher BMI, or, or if they were smoking. So we know that this is a problem for our psoriasis patients. Um, this is another study that we just completed where we looked, um, the last study was just looking at psoriasis patients, so we didn't have any populations to compare them to. But in this study, we looked at um, data from a large national data set called NHANES. It's been used a lot for different, different disease states. And what we were able to do was compare sleep and psoriasis patients to healthy populations. And just as expected, we found that psoriasis patients were more likely to report trouble sleeping compared to those without psoriasis. In fact, they were almost 80% um, higher um, at risk to report trouble sleeping than someone without psoriasis. And I know what you're thinking, you know, psoriasis being itchy, psoriatic arthritis being painful, you know, all of these symptoms kind of, you know, um, will make it harder to sleep, right? That's that's probably what it, what is happening here. But what's interesting is, is that there's a lot of, th there was a study done that looked at almost 3,000 patients with different cutaneous disorders, not just psoriasis, but eczema and other things. And what they found was, is that, um, the symptoms that patients reported, such as itch and pain, they were associated with the sleep disturbance for sure. But even if we were to control for those symptoms, um, patients still were not sleeping well. And so there was something else going on um, that could could that that was leading to sleep disturbance in these patients. Um, this has also already been proven in um, in other disease states, like inflammatory bowel disease, where patients, even when their disease is well controlled and they're not having any symptoms of their disease, they again they're still not sleeping. Sleeping well. And what I told you before is that sleep is really important for the immune system in order to keep the immune system healthy. But what I didn't tell you is that this actually seems to be a cycle as well. And when the immune system is activated too strong or too long, um, such as in a disease like psoriasis, this actually in itself can lead to disturbed sleep. So even when um, even when patients' um, uh, symptoms might be under control, um, such as their pain and itch, that upregulated immune response is still leading to disturbed sleep um, in the long term. So again, this becomes a vicious cycle. We have this hyperactive immune response like we see in psoriasis. This leads to worsening of skin disease, which is leading to sleep loss, which further dysregulates the immune system. And as you can see, this just goes on and on unless we, unless we intervene. 
So for future direction, um, this is what we're calling the UCSF Dreams Team. Um, it includes myself, uh, Dr. Wilson Liao. We have two prominent sleep researchers, Eric Prather, who studies that I um, mentioned earlier, and Dr. Andy Crystal, as well as um, um, uh, epidemiologic sleep researcher, Katie Stone. And we formed this team in order to, to study sleep further um, in patients with psoriasis. Um, this is the DREAMS PSO study. This is actually being um, done uh, in collaboration with the National Psoriasis Foundation. So a lot of those grants that Guy just mentioned, um, uh, many of those have helped me <laughs> to, to further my career, including this one. And in this study, we're actually taking patients with moderate to severe psoriasis, and we're putting them in a sleep lab for three nights, which is a really hard task, and I appreciate my patients so much for helping me with this. Um, but in this way, we're going to be able to get really robust data on how they were they're sleeping, not just the time that they're sleeping, but um, the quality of their sleep. How many times is they're waking up in the middle of the night? What do their sleep cycles look like? Um, we're also drawing blood, and we're going to be looking at the um, association of those sleep cycles with their inflammatory markers. So, so does that sleep um, influence their, their immune response? Does that sleep influence their, their psoriasis? And then in the future, um, we're designing a study called the DREAMS PSO Pro or Prospective Study, where we want to do this study, but we want to do it at home because we realize that sleeping in a sleep lab is not the same as sleeping at home. Um, and so we'll follow patients for long periods of time um, while they're sleeping at home to try to evaluate their sleep in a real world setting. And in this study, we hope to also be looking at those comorbidities like the development of cardiovascular disease and diabetes over time. Um, but in the meantime, what can we be doing? So here are some tips and tricks from, um, from my collaborators, from Dr. Prather, about how to improve sleep. Um, so the really important thing, first of all, is to maintain a sleep schedule. You want to try to go to sleep and try to wake up at the same time every day. And that does take time to reset your system. It's not going to happen overnight. But trying to maintain that sleep schedule trains your body, trains your circadian rhythm um, to, to get sleepy at a certain point in time and wake up at a certain point in time. You want to stay out of bed unless you are sleepy. So you shouldn't be doing other things in your bed because you want your brain to associate your bed only with sleep. Dr. Prather will say the only two things you should be doing in bed are sleep and sex. And so that's that's his his um his words exactly. Um, keep your room cool and dark. There's lots of studies to show that um decreasing your core body temperature can help you to get better, better quality sleep. Decreasing caffeine later in the day, I think, is obvious. So, so know your body and know um, that if there's a you drink caffeine after a certain amount of time, that your body is not going to be able to fall asleep. Um, decrease late night alcohol. Again, lots of studies to show that um, drinking too late at night can actually help cause you to wake up early in the morning, make it harder to fall back asleep. Unplug before bedtime. I think we've all heard this about screen time and the effects of blue light. Um, on your sleep cycle. So trying to, if possible, keeping about an hour between um, your last exposure to a screen and, and when you fall asleep. Consistent exercise and physical activity are also super important. You want your body to feel tired at the end of the day in order to fall asleep nicely. And if you are going to keep naps, naps are not bad, but you want to keep your naps short because you don't want to um, get into the deeper cycles of sleep when you're taking naps because then that's going to influence your, your um sleep later in the night. Um, you want to keep them nice and short just so that you feel a little rested, you feel invigorated, um, but, but you're not influencing your nighttime sleep. And the number one thing, if you can follow none of these tips at all, is basically just to make sleep a priority. So you should be um, stopping everything that you're doing in order to get more sleep um, because it is really important for your health and critical for, for your well-being. And that's all I have. Thank you to all my collaborators, to the National Psoriasis Foundation, of course, for allowing me to do this awesome research. Um, and I can take any questions. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhutani, for your presentation. It does definitely sound like you guys are a dreams team. I can <laughs> agree with that. So um, for the Q&A session, the first question we had from the chat was from Dennis H. And it was, would you suggest measuring cortisol as the measure of the, for the concept of stress and psoriasis? Yeah, I think um, it's a great question. You know, measuring cortisol is probably not the perfect way to, um, to measure stress. But unfortunately, we don't have great objective measures like, you know, blood tests or something that we can do to um, really measure the amounts of stress. So much of the research in psychology and, um, and other fields, cortisol is 
kind of the best corollary we have to, to measuring your internal stress response. But I totally agree that sometimes your internal stress response might not be kind of your personal stress response um, or what your brain perceives as stress. So so there's definitely a difference there, but but it's used in many, many studies. It's kind of a standard at this point. I'll ask you one, Tina. Yeah, so um, you talked about some of the tracking devices earlier at the beginning of your talk. So I wear an aura yeah, ring, aura which ring. really yeah. helped me to understand you know, where my sleep patterns were and to try to kind of identify some of those clues for myself of, you know, what was I doing different on the weekends maybe versus a weekday that might be totally. affecting my sleep or the kids interrupting, right? You in the middle <laughs> of the night. Um, do you recommend to patients that are trying to get a better understanding that they try a tool like that um, to, to try to see if there is some pattern to what's happening to their sleep or if their sleep is being impacted that they don't realize? Yeah, I, I really do. So I recommend these trackers to my patients all the time. Um, the, the tricky thing is, though, is that these trackers, Apple Watch, Fitbit, or a Ring, um, they're basically using a technology called accelerometry. And so they're basically just looking at movement to estimate the amount of sleep, right? They don't have electrodes hooked up to your brain to see when you're actually sleeping and, you know, things like that. So um, if somebody is itching in the middle of the night or if somebody's kind of tossing and turning in the middle of the night, it'll pick that up as they're not sleeping, even though maybe they are asleep and they're just unconsciously itching. Um, and so patients with skin disease, it's a little bit complicated, but I do still think that you get good trends. Um, and, you know, if you are waking up well rested and your sleep monitors are showing that you're um, not sleeping well, then maybe you are itching and you don't realize it, you know. So I still think it's important um, to, to kind of, you know, understand the different um, uh, patterns of sleep. Um, and some people get really motivated by it. You know, they they like gamification, like, you know, they see it and they want to try to improve their sleep. So they challenge themselves. And so that's what I also like about it is it really is a motivating factor to see it. Yeah. Another question from the chat, so from Natalie Thompson, is there an ideal amount of hours to sleep above se seven hours, but not as much as 10 or 11 if it's poor sleep? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question, too. So, yes, I think um, the studies have shown that for the average U.S. population, that seven hours of sleep is kind of the magical number, seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, and so if you find that you need more sleep than seven to eight hours, um, sure, you know, there's certain people that that might just need those extra hours of sleep, and that's totally okay. But you do want to actually think about, like, could there be something else going on, something like sleep apnea, um, or the quality of sleep? Are you waking up a lot in the middle of the night? Like, what else is going on? And so again, as Leah just said, you know, using a sleep tracker or something of those sorts to see what's happening in those 10 hours of sleep could be really helpful, because there might be something going on that we just don't know about. Such a good point. Yeah. And another question from the chat uh, from Jan Dickinson. If you can't get to sleep, is it best to stay in bed or get up and maybe try to read for a few minutes? That's a great question. And I think a question that Dr. Prather gets in his um, sleep clinic all the time. And the answer is yes. If you're not, if you can't fall asleep, you should get out of bed um, and do something else until you kind of feel sleepy and then get back in bed. Because again, um, you don't want that anxiety um, associated with not being able to sleep um, associated with your bed, basically, because otherwise the next time you get in bed, that same anxiety kind of comes back and, and you probably will have trouble sleeping again. So you should only be getting in bed once you kind of feel pretty tired. Let's see. The, I see a question about does lack of sleep and psoriasis increase the chance of getting cancer? Um, so individually, um, we know that uh, lack of sleep over the long term has been associated with um, with increased risk of cancers, actually many different kinds of cancers. And psoriasis in itself has also been associated with an increased risk of certain types of cancers, especially things like lymphoma. Um, and so although we don't have any studies that are looking at the impact of psoriasis plus sleep on the impact of cancer, individually, both of those do increase the risk of cancer. So I would think there might be a an effect there, but I don't think we have the studies to prove it, unfortunately. Some suggestions for how to, to get better sleep. Reading an electromagnetics engineering book, that sounds like a perfect way to get me to sleep. <laughs> yeah. 
do you recommend a routine to get into sleep mode? Um, I think it can be helpful again, you know, for training your brain. I think it gets back to that, you know, maintaining a sleep schedule. I think we talk about this with kids all the time, right? We have our wind down time. You have this routine so that your kids know it's time to sleep. They start to get tired. You put them in bed. Um, and so I think a lot of those things can also be used for ourselves. You know, that one hour turning off the screens, um, maybe dimming the lights, lowering the temperature of the room, kind of prepping your body in order to get ready for sleep, um, I think can be can be very important. So yeah, I totally am on um, on board for a routine to get people into sleep mode. Does taking medications that make you sleepy help or hurt your sleep, such as allergy, allergy medications, et cetera? Um, for the most part, these medications do help your sleep. Um, um, what we don't know, um, especially in psoriasis, is, um, you know, overall, it'll help your sleep, but we don't know, does it actually influence you to not get deep sleep? Um, so there's there's different types of sleep. There's kind of the lighter sleep cycles, and there's deeper sleep cycles. And, um, and what we don't understand is if um, these medications will basically, you know, could it actually be decreasing the amount of deep sleep you're getting, but giving you more lighter sleep. And so these are kind of things that we're going to be studying in that in that long-term prospectives trial um, is the influence of these medications on the actual sleep cycles. Another question from Dennis H. Um, what are the most important moderators and mediators that increase or decrease the effect of sleep? If a patient is on a biologic that achieves POSI 100, does sleep quality still matter? Or does bad sleep quality get a bigger effect if someone is exposed to an impact factor such as skin trauma? So I think um, I'll, I'll answer it one at a time. What are the most important moderators and mediators that increase or decrease the effect of sleep? Um, to be honest, I don't think we know all of it completely. But, um, but like I showed in those studies, um, the amount of psoriasis that someone has, the more severe their psoriasis, or if they have things like psoriatic arthritis, um, <laughs> does impact sleep. So we know that that will, will um, impact sleep. Um, but to your next question, if a patient on a biologic achieves completely clear skin, does the sleep quality still matter? And I think the answer is yes. Um, so again, we don't have the specific studies in psoriasis just yet, but in rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, we see that even once the disease is well controlled, patients are asymptomatic, um, they're still having um, poorer sleep compared to patients without those diseases. So so um, I don't think our job is done just by getting the skin clear, which is why I want to, you know, do these studies to help study the impact of sleep interventions, um, because I think we can still make an impact even, even beyond clearing, clearing someone's skin. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Dr. Patani. Here today with the latest information about research in nutrition and psoriasis is dermatologist Dr. Benjamin Kaffenberger. He's the Associate Professor of Dermatology, Director of the Medical Student Research Program at the College of Medicine, and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Dermatology at Ohio State University and Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Kaffenberger specializes in hospital dermatology and immune-mediated skin diseases. You may have heard of Dr. Kaffenberger if you listen to Soundbites, episode number 62 which we explore his research around oral health symptoms and diet in the development of and severity of psoriasis. Dr. Kaffenberger is continuing to explore the relationship of diet and psoriasis. Dr. Kaffenberger is here today to provide the latest information he's learned about the role of nutrition. So let's all welcome Dr. Kaffenberger. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or, well, I'm sorry, good afternoon, I guess. Um, if you're on the East Coast, and and uh, good morning to those who are in Oregon and with the MPF. So, thank you so much for having me. It's a it's a huge honor, and I'm I'm uh, feel great and and to have this opportunity. Feel very blessed to have this opportunity to speak before you today, and and specifically to be funded um, by the National Psoriasis Foundation as well to look into this association in the first place, which is um, a huge opportunity and and. I think something that's an unmet need because this came around largely by patients, um, grassroots patients asking these kind of questions. And um, and that's been a, a major motivating factor throughout this. So uh, hopefully that'll come out in my talk here. All right. So so today I'm going to talk about skin, nutrition, and oral health. I do have a couple of disclosures. Um, so in terms of funding, 
Uh, I am funded mostly as an investigator for, for multiple uh, clinical trial organizations. Um, as far as that goes, though, we will not be discussing any actual pharmaceutical therapies in psoriasis today. So I, I think that for the most part, these are not relevant, um, with the exception of the National Psoriasis Foundation um, and their funding into our intermittent fasting setting. So major thank you to the National Psoriasis Foundation for your uh, support. I have two major objectives I'm hoping that you'll get out of the, the discussion today. And, and the first one is to recognize that there are known associations of nutrients and micronutrient disorders with skin disease in particular. Uh, and then the second is that I want to be able to discuss, hopefully come away just with a uh, ability to discuss what's happening, the existing research on uh, oral health, dieting, and association with, with both the development and the severity of psoriasis as well too. So some uh, non kind of pharmacologic methods to, to hopefully control disease and improve disease, especially. Where did this all come from? Well, it, it really came from, from two parts. And I think the first um, uh, one aspect that, that came at this was my specialization in, in hospital dermatology, where when I first started my career, I was seeing patients in the hospital every day um, and, and running our consult service every day. And I've stepped back a little bit from that over the time. But it wasn't uncommon for us to see patients such as this one, where the emergency department is saying, you know, this is just a patient that's just been let go forever. And, and, you know, what has happened? We have no idea what's happening with this patient, whether this is psoriasis, whether this is a more severe disease. Um, we don't know, but this patient is not obviously not in a healthy place, uh, is not someone who should be at, at home until that this patient is in a much, much, much healthier place. And when we look at patients um, like this patient and, and other patients, um, this this was nutritional disease. Um, this was a patient that had a really severe nutritional disease. And, and the kicker here is that, that a skin biopsy in, in a patient like this would show psoriasis, actually. Um, and so there are some some high overs from that standpoint. The, the other major kind of impetus for, for this work and this research that I've done is the patients themselves. And, and it's patients coming in in particular and saying, um, I'm not feeling great about going on such and such medication. I know you have a plan to, to be more aggressive about my psoriasis, um, but are there other options? Or I've done my own research and I'm interested in doing a gluten-free diet. Um, what What is the data? What do you recommend that? And so that's been a major uh, impetus. Uh, the two of these have been the major impetus. Some, some of the kind of early work that we did in this area to kind of build on the nutrition nutritional aspect is, um, is for example, this study, which we published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, but what this, this basically shows, the gray lines is, are the overall number of, of patients that we were seeing in our hospital setting for dermatologic diseases or who were in our hospital period, whether or not dermatology saw them or not. The blue line is the number of patients that, you know, my service was seeing in the hospital. So that was about somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 of the patients of three, three, 700 to 4,000 patients per year um, who had some sort of skin disease that was documented. And the point that, that I wanted to make here is, is just that if you don't look for nutritional diseases or if you don't consider oral health, hygiene, um, malnutrition, nutritional disorders, you're not going to diagnose them. And so, you know, I think 2012, 2013, this was towards the end of my residency. And 2014 is when I actually took over. Um, the service. And you can see that our number of, of diagnoses that we're making, it, and I'll, I'll fully admit that I think we're still uh, underestimating the total number of patients that, that are affected by these nutrient disorders, but it has nearly doubled when our overall number of patients that we're seeing is still very similar across. So um, the point here is just that if you're not looking for them or not considering them, you're not going to find them. Um, and they're not without impact either. So again, patients with especially zinc-associated dermatoses often do have a, a, a biopsy that can show psoriasis-like thickening of the skin. Um, and these are not insignificant. Diagnosing these are important. This is in our hospital setting, in our hospital patients. But the patients that, that had these disorders, nutrient disorders, um, not only did they stay in the hospital much longer because they, they looked sicker, they weren't improving, um, but also patients were more likely to die when they were diagnosed with these disorders as well, too. So it is actually a critical, it's not, not just something that's, um, uh, you know, just an appearance thingy. 
this is a uh, one of our colleagues work at a, at a different institution but it's showing basically the same thing and it's published around the same time um, and what this is showing is that patients with with skin diseases with nutritional disorders whether that's zinc whether that's a macronutrient like a protein like albumin is what's being measured here um, the patient's survival is different depending on whether these are identified or not so it is a critical thing to identify when you're suspicious and, and i can go over some things that make us suspicious these are the, the list of, of micronutrient uh, deficiencies that have very well established uh, dermatoses and and these are the features these are some of the features that you, we consider when we're um, determining whether this is um, present or not so um, macronutrients these, these are proteins these are proteins cholesterols li lipids means this is um, carbohydrates um, and, and most often this is measured by by, by protein level um, different kind of findings that you see lanugo hairs these, these are these really light fine hairs that, that are actually uh, widespread swelling of the body is very characteristic with a, a wasted appearance these flaky paint but that that can be thickening of the skin as well too that can be suspicious suspicious for other diseases that, that look in the psoriasis like category um, and then some micronutrient um, this is our, our vitamins deficiency vitamins and, and um, minerals as well too and so you can see specific hair changes that a, a dermatologist can identify under, underneath the microscope seborrheic dermatitis which which is very uh, challenging to differentiate from psoriasis in specific situations um, and then some nail changes and some mouth changes as well too and I, I can go through some of these images just to give you an idea and we can see them in different different areas of the body too so this is a different way to kind of look at it um, but scalp so seeing someone that has like a psoriasis like pattern just on the scalp that's really extreme and not responding to treatments um, that can be associated with some of our b vitamin deficiencies for example um, patients that have a an inverse pattern uh, of psoriasis that look like just inverse pattern um, but it's more eroded typically so that can be almost a, a zinc uh, type pattern as well too so the and so this is kind of what I was saying earlier about about these locations. The seborrheic dermatitis is a B vitamin association that that can be present. Most cases aren't, but but it can be something to consider. Um, and then as we had discussed, this this um, the same thing that has like inverse pattern when it's in the folds of the skin that can actually be a zinc deficiency. Um, these are some appearances of, of patients that uh, we've had in the hospital, um, and and again kind of push this whole process along and develop made me develop that interest in, in nutrition um, and the relationship with the skin in the first place this is a patient that has this this flaky paint kind of of skin um, it's thickening of the skin that, that you see and, and on a biopsy it would be thickening of the skin similar to psoriasis um, this is a, a patient that has a protein deficiency this is a patient that has a, a b vitamin deficiency and this you can see that it has a predominance of the sun exposed areas in, in particular um, of his body um, and so this is actually a specific b vitamin uh, deficiency that this patient had um, he, here's a patient that has numerous of these open um, what we call comedones or, or blackheads just diffusely this is a patient that has a vitamin a deficiency this is a patient that has a multi-nutrient deficiency scaly dermatitis multi-nutrients uh, uh, were, de were detected uh, same thing this is the same patient in her legs and you see this extensive bruising as well too so while you could actually consider for her back you know could this be a very early psoriasis you put more together with it and the fact that she's got this extensive bruising in her legs and in uh, this bruising at least this is vitamin c deficiency that's that's what we call scurvy um and so this is a different patient but but same kind of thing this is as classic as it gets for for you know i think most people have heard of scurvy so i'll say it like that but that's vitamin c deficiency um you know it wasn't just a disease of, of sailors in 1800s this this disease very much still exists and the cdc says it's maybe six to seven percent of the population is deficient in vitamin c most of them are not getting as severe as what this patient has in the previous patient where they, they have bleeding into their joints um, but it's not an inconsequential disease at all um, here's here's another patient in the hospital setting just another example but but same thing it's that that bleeding that that bruising that the patient has in their joints you see that on top of some other other features and that just makes you much more suspicious that, that patient does have a, a a nutrient disorder and uh, this is another patient a, a different patient um, who has this overgrowth of their their uh, gingiva uh, and this is another manifestation of, of vitamin c deficiencies as well too 
this is a patient, if we biopsy this, we'd see some thickening of the skin. Um, there, and there can be some other clues to um, nutrient disorders, but uh, they, uh, our, our data shows that they look often um, diagnosed as a psoriasis-like disorder on, when, we, when we biopsy these patients. And the, these more specific features that you look for or that we're taught to look for um, are not always seen. Um, same, same kind of thing. Predominant folds is a zinc deficiency patient. Um, and these are also, also the same patient. So. so just a couple more kind of points before I get into a little bit more specific data about, about diets. But when we look at our, our patient data here, and we've now run it across, um, you know, I showed some early data, but we've been much more aggressive about testing patients. And we're looking at um, hundreds of patients that have had skin disorders in our hospital setting and also had uh, been tested for micronutrients um, during their hospitalization. Um, there, there's a couple really kind of key things. And so we have the different micronutrients up here labeled out, but a couple really kind of key things to, to point out is that patients that um, may have malnutrition are not what you necessarily expect. And so in our hospital setting, when we look at patients, it's not, we, we, and we do have patients, I, I, you can see from the, the body type of some of the patients, we have some very, very thin patients that, that you know, maybe stereotypically you think of have a nutrient deficiency. But our average BMI of our patients that have these disorders, it's not underweight. It's not normal weight even. Um, the average BMI for our patients with these micronutrient disorders is actually uh, overweight and even obese in certain situations and certain disease or certain types as well too. So you can't just rely on, oh, this person's body weight suggests that maybe they have malnourished. Um, it, it's a different uh, it's a different issue. Someone can be getting plenty of carbohydrates, but not getting the additional nutrients that they need in addition to that. Other things is that there's just a couple of specific diseases that, that do also really need to kind of increase our suspicion. Chronic liver disease um, is one that should really increase our, our suspicion. Patients that have had bariatric surgery and malabsorption, um, the numbers aren't huge that we have with this, uh, but at the same time, the overall numbers that are in the hospital uh, are very low. So, so patients that have had bariatric surgery, even if they're not, you know, thin necessarily, or they're not underweight, still need to consider these these micronutrients um, disorders, psychiatric disorders, and cancer. Uh, um, cancer patients, in particular, it has to be also considered. The metabolism of the body increases significantly, and they have a higher micronutrient. Um, requirement, um, and so that that increases their uh, demand. And if you test the patients, oftentimes we'll find that there is a micronutrient disorder, and maybe two um, a quarter a quarter of our data. I'm going to skip through this just in the interest of time here, um, but there are tests for these different micronutrient disorders, and they're usually typically without insurance, somewhere between fifty and eighty dollars for most most of the tests, um, plasma tests. There are, are concerns with some of them. Some of them are not a good test of the full body um, reserves that, that are present, but it, it's at least a place to start. And, and I think just even considering it is really the place to start. And that's what, what drove a lot of our, our further research. So that, that's my background and that's kind of what got us into this next step. And so um, the next objective that I'm hopeful, hopeful that you will get out of this is, is to be able to discuss um, research that, that's ongoing and, and that's, that's been already done that is looking at oral health, diets, nutrition, um, specifically in patients that have chronic psoriasis as well, too. This is a little infographic looking at, um, you know, what kind of role do these these areas play in? And, and it's much more complicated, of course, than this, but um, clearly there's a huge genetic susceptibility component to psoriasis that, that's leading to systemic inflammation. Um, there is this aspect of the, the Western diet, um, a pro-inflammatory diet, um, as a form of a trigger that's also leading and also driving some forms of, 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 of systemic inflammation. And that may be able to be reduced by things like a Mediterranean diet, changing the diet. There's also signaling molecules um, specifically from the fat cells where things like weight loss can actually make a difference in the overall systemic inflammation levels. And then this 
chronic systemic inflammation. We know that has multiple downstream consequences, but in particular to psoriasis, you know, we see this kind of pathway where it gets down to activation of the T cells, and then the T cells activating the actual skin cells to over proliferate. And, and then that's what we're seeing as the disease psoriasis. The uh, molecules in between, these are these are the chemical si signaling molecules that actually drive that differentiation, drive and push those T cells in the direction um, and the skin cells to over overproduce. So I want to first start with kind of the association of oral health and skin disease. So not even going into nutrition quite yet, but, you know, we took an interest in, in this area first. And, and, you know, we know that there's numerous comorbidities among patients with psoriasis that may be part of the disease, driving the disease or just, just um, maybe even there by happenstance. But one of them is, is different um, oral health outcomes that are present. So we did a systematic review. This is back um, a few years ago, looking at, at uh, anything that had to do with, with dental, oral, tonsil health, um, and any sort of article that's published in association with psoriasis. And what we'll see, I don't have a good infographic to give you, but there's basically three different things that, that are widely published. And, and the first one is, is periodontal disease, periodontitis, gingivitis, the active inflammation. So around the gums that patients will develop. And it can be multifactorial. Many things will contribute to it. Smoking contributes to it without a doubt. Alcohol contributes to it. Poor diet contributes to it. Uh, poor hygiene contributes to it. All of those things uh, con contribute to the development of this. But so of the three kind of themes, one is, is the development of periodontal disease being associated with psoriasis. So patients with this periodontal disease, inflammation of the gums um, is strongly associated with psoriasis. The second main theme is, is the microbiome. So the different bacteria that are present in the mouth and, and the bacteria are different in patients with uh, psoriasis and not, not everyone, but uh, at least they're more likely. And in, in particular, it's the streptococcal bacteria uh, that's present or streptococcal genus that, that's present more often in patients that have that have psoriasis. And that makes sense because, you know, strep throats associations with especially children um, and getting that gut hate form of psoriasis, that makes sense. But it but it may be more than just just that. And so it's definitely worth further, further research and further investigation. And then the third one, which I think is out there pretty well, and the data is very good, and it's probably partly related to this as well, as which, which is the association of tonsillectomies um, and improvement, at least of gut hate psoriasis. But even in some patients with chronic plaque psoriasis, there can be some improvement as well, too, especially gut hate psoriasis, but, but even chronic plaque psoriasis as well, too. So um, those are the three, three major themes that are out there. But I think that there's even more than this, and I think that there, there ought to be even more research in this area because I think it is, a, it is a critical one. I also think that there's challenges here because when we look at large data sets, there's a disconnect between... Um, dental records and and medical records for patients and and it's a, a shame because we know that there's a strong association with psoriasis and in oral health uh a challenge is though is is that when we look at how the data is uh, inputted we lose a lot of the dental data at least in the united states databases because um it's a different insurance that that they're going through in the first place um, and so we're not collecting at the same time the diagnoses, whether periodontal diagnoses were made in the first place. And I don't know many dermatologists or, or uh, primary care doctors that are making this diagnosis of periodontal disease either, or even ENT. So next after that, we wanted to look at, uh, this is just a survey of, of patients that we had in our clinic. And so we looked at our, our psoriasis patients and we had a control group of all other diagnoses that we were seeing in the, in the, um, the clinics. And we wanted to kind of work along this oral health aspect, and uh, we we handed out a survey. Uh, it was a World Health Organization validated survey to them, and had had all patients that that were interested um, fill out the survey. And what we wanted to look at is just um, the state of their oral health according to this World Health Organization um, uh, um, survey that we were doing. Um, the most important col column is, is this one here. Um, and so this is looking at characteristics of our patients that have psoriasis versus our patients that don't have psoriasis. So, so what are the, some of the main differences that we're seeing in terms of 
um, and this is just an abbreviated table, but we have to get kind of the, the things that don't even we would know or that we know are associated with psoriasis. So family history of psoriasis, of course, is strongly associated with our group that has, has psoriasis. But similarly, like just what we said, personal history of strep throat, it wasn't just patients with gut hate psoriasis. Um, this group was 90% chronic black psoriasis. Um, but at the same time, the psoriasis patients were two times as likely as, as patients that were control patients so who did not have psoriasis to have a history of strep throat infections in the first place. And that's adjusting for other uh, confounding variables, other variables that are important. Personal history of, of rheumatoid arthritis, um, that was also something that, that was seen here, but but same thing, we think that might've been um, some misdiagnosis with psoriatic arthritis most likely. Um, but so so the key kind of thing here is, is that even in this chronic black psoriasis group, it's not just gut taste psoriasis, we need to look harder in, in most patients with psoriasis. Um, as far as the strep, strep association. And then, so this is the same, this is a, uh, the same survey that we were handing out to patients, but also same kind of odds ratio. So, so patients with psoriasis compared to our other groups were twice as likely, two times as likely to have, have had some sort of oral pain discomfort over the past 12 months. So they were twice as likely to respond um, affirmatively to that question as our control patients. And we think that is, that is impactful. I mean, so I, I don't diagnose my patients with periodontitis. I'm not, not, a, um, an expert enough to do that, but we do think that there's some impact here that, that our psoriasis patients are, uh, twice as likely as, as our other, other skin disease patients, um, to report this oral pain and discomfort. And the follow-up study that I'd like to do of this is also looking at access to care, especially uh, dental dental access to care um, among our patients and whether there's a difference. Um, the second aspect that, that we we're also trying to do is, is looking in between our patients that have psoriasis and looking at if there's certain associations that the survey that we handed out with them, um, you know, are there specific associations that we're seeing that impact the severity of their psoriasis? And we're measuring the severity of their psoriasis by their overall body surface, how much of the body surface and how the severe it is. And we made it into it. Well, we didn't make it into it. We used a validated uh, a score um, based on those two factors. And so what you, you'll notice here in bold here, and this is the important column here, the bold, bold are the ones that, that are most impactful. Um, the ones that we're, we believe are reliable based on the patient numbers that we have. But body mass index, yeah, so, so heavier patients were a little bit more likely to have more severe forms of psoriasis. Patients rated their own gum health. Patients that um, self-rated their own gum health as poor or very poor were significantly, significantly, significantly more likely to have severe psoriasis, severe forms of psoriasis. Patients that have had experienced speech difficulty over the past 12 months again and and, and the um so there's a difference you know of it's associated it's not association and then there's a a, a level of you know is it a small association is it extensive um and these are big um differences that we are seeing between the group that says no and the group that says yes um patients that are seeing speech difficulty their psoriasis is much more severe than the others and then um you know so then we went down and you, know, you can see this is a negative number but patients that had, compared to patients that seldom ate fresh fruit, uh, the ones that ate every day or several times per day, you can see it's a negative number. Um, there's a significant negative association to the severity. So those patients were more likely, far more likely to have more mild psoriasis. So um, we think this all feeds into to, um, the type of bacteria that are present, the health of the gingiva that are present, the health around the teeth. Um, and tonsils as well too, this whole uh, microenvironment in the mouth in, in the first place and, and think that that's impacting probably more patients than what we give credit for their psoriasis. We extended this a little bit further and we did a different survey looking at, at different patient diseases and this was directly to some um, Facebook group. So it wasn't, we didn't actually validate how severe these patients were, but this was actually a question looking at, you know, are dermatologists, are we doing enough to counsel our patients in the first place, whether that's, in, in this is looking at several different diseases, but in particular, something like psoriasis, um, major conditions that impact the health, the oral health 
smoking is one of the most deleterious ones. Um, you know, our, our dermatologists, if we just look at a, a random sample of patients that are on a Facebook affinity group for psoriasis and these other diseases, our our dermatologist, uh, we asked our, our dermatologist counseling, have you been counseled about a, an association with your skin disease? Um, and, and these are different between different diseases because, you know, there's different associations between these different diseases, but we're seeing about 53% of patients with psoriasis were being counseled as far as alcohol and smoking. Now, vaping, you know, we were just trying to get some information on, on vaping and marijuana. We don't actually know that there's any sort of association. We were just looking looking at that uh, more relationship with some of these other skin diseases too. But it's happening. Some, some dermatologists are, but um, we think that that needs to be higher. We think more more dermatologists do need to talk to patients about oral health and what they can do, whether that's seeing a dentist, whether that's that's uh, avoiding smoking, especially. And that kind of brings us to to the dietary aspect here, and in our current research, this this is a systematic review that we did, and we're looking at intermittent fasting, which is a relatively popular form of calorie restriction. Um, or becoming a relatively popular form. And, and the idea here is, and it, there's different methods of doing this, but two to three days a week more, could make it more, or you could make it less. You choose a window where you're not going to consume any calories during that time frame. So 16, 16 hours twice a week is a very common method of doing it, but it could be multiple. Um, something that's out there in the literature a lot is actually during the, the Islamic holiday of Ramadan, when uh, Muslims, observant Muslims, do not are fasting between um, uh, sun up and sundown, uh, which, depending on the season, could be lo even longer than twelve hours. Um, there are several studies out there actually looking at patients and, and how their psoriasis did. So we found a series of studies. Um, they do have limitations. Um, and, and, you know, so this is our study here. This is our protocol. Doc, Dr. Uh, Gray's is with my fellow last year. Um, and there's another one actually that's being done very similar to ours uh, in Belgium as well, too. And we've actually reached out to them to, to see if there's any interesting collaboration. We haven't really heard back, but um, there's, there is a similar one, both of which were started in 2022. Um, but there's about five different studies that have been previously done. How good are they? They're, they're okay. I mean, none of them are randomized. So the quality quality of data is, is, is it's okay. But there's definitely some evidence using these that um, this form of calorie restriction, and, and there's different methods of doing this. So you can see here like 14 hours a day, 17 hours a day, make a difference, not only in body weight, but also patient psoriasis. So outcome measures like the PASI improving as well too. This is uh, beyond just intermittent fasting. Uh, I think this is a paper that Dr. Bhutani was actually involved in. Um, beyond just intermittent fasting, any method of calorie restriction. And, and um, again, same kind of issues. The study quality is not always great because a lot of times they'll be doing diet plus active therapeutic like cyclosporin, uh, TNF inhibitor. Um, and so there's, there's more confounding in these. But the overall takeaway is that patients that, that went on and were successful with a low calorie diet and able to adhere to it did tend to have better psoriasis, uh, psoriasis outcomes in addition to, to uh, other beneficial outcomes, namely weight loss. This is uh, more specifically to just Mediterranean diet. So, so taking this kind of different fats, so, so far less animal fats, butters, uh, meat in the diet, and, and having a higher proportion of fish, olive oil um, in the diet. Two of them are, are uh, studies um, where they actually enrolled patients. One is just a survey. But the patients that had more severe psoriasis overall takeaway is that patients with more severe psoriasis were less likely to follow or less likely to adhere to this type of diet. Uh, and patients that did adhere more to a, a Mediterranean diet and a higher, um, a higher rigidity of that Mediterranean diet had improved psoriasis outcomes compared to the patients that did, did not. Gluten-free is another type of dieting that patients will ask a lot about. Um, and the data is not quite as strong here, but patients, there are several studies that show patients that have antibodies, so, so the blood tests showing that the, their um, uh, B cells have developed recognition 
to, to gluten to confirm it, those patients in particular may do better. Their psoriasis may also do better with a gluten-free diet. Patients that don't have the antibodies, maybe, maybe not. Um, and the last kind of other kind of diet that I think is, is relatively popular that there's some, some evidence here for is, is the ketogenic diet. So um, this is patients that are avoiding carbohydrates in particular, most forms of the carbohydrates um, and having a much higher proportion of fats and proteins in their diet to reduce the, the carbohydrate load. Both of these studies were, were done by the same investigator um, in a very short study as well, too. It definitely has some limitations to the study, but the study did show that, that there were significant improvements in psoriasis severity associated with even doing the keto diet for four weeks, in addition to having weight loss for the patients as well, too. You may be interested in supplements as well, too. Um, a, kind of a quick summary of this since we're, we're running a little bit low on time. Fish oil supplements may be a, some modest at best effects. Some studies, other controlled studies have shown no effects. So it's, it's a little bit uh, to be determined. Oral vitamin D, certainly if you're vitamin D deficient, yes, supplement it. Now, if you're not vitamin D deficient, it typically looks like PASI scores are not changing with it. And then selenium, smaller studies, uh, lower quality, and there's very mixed effects across low quality uh, studies. So it's very uncertain there as well, too. So that brings us to kind of um, data that's fresh off the press. We're, we're finishing up the study. We've got still a few more patients on, on it. But this is the actual study that the National Psoriasis Foundation um, funded us to do. And we've got enrolled 42 patients throughout the <clears throat> Ohio region where we randomized patients to either control um, where we asked them not to change their diet and versus patients that were uh, intermittent fasting, asking them to do 16 hours a day, at least twice a week. And we logged everything as well, too, for them as well, because we wanted to get what their adherence was. Now, a key thing with this is, is that unlike some of these other studies, we did not enroll patients with severe disease, moderate to severe disease, because um, we felt like there's less of, with where this was, with, with funding and everything like that, if, if patients were going on to... to biologics or, or advanced uh, pharmaceutical treatments at the same time, it would really impact our results and we'd have to throw a bunch of patients off um, the study. So instead, we actually thought there was a bigger place for patients that were uh, often on these treatments, but maybe not completely controlled. So, it, but it, so it's, it's mild, patients with mild psoriasis in the first place. So it's a little bit of a different category than what our other uh, studies we've looked at um, have shown. And so in addition to that, since it is milder patients, the, we wouldn't be surprised if the, the overall effect size is lower than some of these other studies that have shown in intermittent fasting. So, But overall, between our intermittent fasting group and our control group, <clears throat> male to female proportions, very similar. Um, most of the patients were white that enrolled in this. So we, it, you know, this is a preliminary study. We are looking to increase our diversity on, a, on an additional study later to make sure that this does is more applicable to um, um, people throughout the America and throughout the world. The proportion of patients with psoriatic arthritis, some around 27, 30% in each group. Um, and about 45, somewhere between 45 and 60% of our patients were on a, a biologic uh, therapy uh, at the time of enrollment. These are the overall kind of numbers of our patients as well too that we put on, on the study. So the overall BMI is somewhere between 33 and 39 um, for, for the patients. Um, waist length in centimeters is, is, is 44 to 47. And then the severity as far as the patients measured their severity as far as psoriasis, that's being mild, um, but the control group is a little bit higher. They actually were thinking that more moderate, um, but they went based on my scoring, which is investigator global, and that, that was mild for them to qualify in the first place. But you can still even see with, with that being mild, uh, it was still an impactful uh, score that the, as far as how much their psoriasis was affecting them. So our primary outcome that we're looking at here was with, with a small study like this is we're looking actually at it, at uh, how to power the next study, how, how to run the next study. And so there's a couple key things that we need to, to make sure is, is so what's going to be our adherence? Are the patients actually going to do this? What's going to be the dropout rate? Uh, and so we learned a lot from doing this. And, and so we did demonstrate feasibility, which is what our whole goal was with a small study like this. Um, overall, as far as adherence, we had strong adherence in our group. Challenge, though, is that the uh, control patients um, were disappointed, we heard this over and over, to, to be randomly selected into the control group 
And so they were kind of asking, well, can I do this anyway? Um, can I get, and so we didn't give them the information, um, the handout information that we wanted our, our, our experimental patients to do. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't doing it and, and, and going through it. So we did learn a little bit from that, you know, a crossover design where our, our patients could switch over if, if they were in the control group for the first three months. We actually adapted the protocol six months into it to, to make it a crossover because without that, actually, we were having a much higher dropout rate than, than what we were anticipating. And uh, that dropout rate would, would make a, a larger study very difficult to do. So once we changed things over to the crossover, it slowed things down a little bit. And so we still have patients that are, that are not complete yet, um, but it should be complete. They should be complete within the next two months at this point. Um, but we'll have higher quality data and, and, and in particular, we'll have the control data that we need. This is um, our blue group. This is our, our patients that, that went through the intermittent fasting protocol. And so the average patient did lose several kilograms in this. Um, the average patient did lose, decrease their psoriasis severity a little bit, modestly. And then the patient global assessment, so like how much did you improve? The average patient did improve with this as well, too. Now, the control group also showed some, some uh, features of improvement in some of these as well, too. And um, that's an important thing for as we expand out the study. These are the actual numbers um, for, for how much, but again, um, <clears throat> uh, the patients uh, on average lost several kilograms uh, in, in a, our three month study in the first place. So, um, and that corresponds with a, a one point decrease in, in how they uh, assess their psoriasis severity on a five-point scale. So uh, the patients felt like they were improving with it as well, too, although there could be some placebo effect here, too. So our overall conclusions here, and, and, and again, thank you so much to the National Psoriasis Foundation for supporting this preliminary study in the first place. This allows us to have feasibility, but we did demonstrate feasibility. So we, so the rate of, of loss of follow-up, especially in our control group that we had, we were able to correct our protocol six months into that, put the crossover component, and, and that's how we'd recommend a larger study to be done so we can keep that control group in, involved in the study and not lose interest. And so we need to have those incentives for those patients. The adherence, though, was great among our patients, and so that was a really, um, um, we were very pleased about that. Um, only modest improvements in psoriasis scores are seen compared to the data that's um, out there in, in the literature. With that being said, though, um, the patients had mild psoriasis in the first place. So this wasn't patients that had the most severe forms of psoriasis. And so uh, the effect size could still be much larger for patients that have more severe disease. <clears throat> and then this is just kind of a summary of, of the existing literature, which, which we've kind of talked about for the most part. Um, these kind of diets here at the bottom. Um, energy levels, which is like carbohydrates, how, how many calories are you consuming, really needs to be uh, individualized to the patient in the first place. It's hard to make a, a broad um, um, recommendation to everybody. It needs to be individualized to these different different um, comorbidities. Okay. Um, and again, that's all I have. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll take some questions here in just a second. Um, but I got a, had a fantastic team. I'm so grateful for for all of my members of my team, <clears throat> especially Dr. Gray, who kind of led the, the intermittent fasting study. Um, but each one of these have, have helped me. And a uh, major thank you to our, our funders, especially the National Psoriasis Foundation, which, which made this happen. Okay, so I'll try to go in order. I've got about 10, 10 questions here. So um, one question is, um, various deficiencies related to vitamins and other nutrients, are they identified easily be, by standard blood testing or is more specific testing needed? It, it, this is a really good question. So they, there is a blood test for these different micronutrient diseases that can be done very easily. The challenge with them is they don't necessarily test your full body stores. So they can test, so testing your plasma, your, um, your blood for, uh, for example, like your B vitamin level is super easy to do. The challenge is it's very dependent on what you just ate in the last 24 hours. And it's not necessarily so like uh, a patient that's been starved for, for six months and then just ate a, a Big Mac is, is going to have high levels. And so it's not necessarily, there's not necessarily great tests for that. So there does have to be some discussion and some 
that you can't rely just on, on the lab test. I have another comment, um, agree with what is being presented. All flare-ups, mineral and vitamin counts show up at the lowest end recommended um, or higher end of the deficient. And doctors always explain that these levels are not something reflective of my deficiency disease. <clears throat> I try to convince them my flare-up started when I started seeing my legs swelling, particularly of the shoulders, um, is now due to lower red blood cell count and anemia. Uh, and as a consequence of low B12. Yeah, I mean, I think these things uh, definitely can be, be associated and especially from overall health. I mean, um, even if we're, some of these things, like I, I think there needs to be so much more research in, into this area, um, but you can't argue that uh, some of this B12 deficient and anemic, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not good for their overall health to, to supplement it. And there are certainly patients that are anemic and, and are itchy specifically from that. Um, thank you, uh, Dana, for the, the link to the uh, sound bites episode. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so question about, about the keto diet. And so keto diet is another popular one. It's not one that we specifically studied, but we did do, uh, or actually we, I showed you, I think, uh, in, in this um, on the keto diet. So again, keto diet is reducing your carbohydrate intake very uh, extensively to minimize your, your blood sugars. And what you're trying to do is keep yourself full. Um, and so you, you don't have to like starve yourself, but you're eating proteins, you're eating, uh, lipids, fats, um, um, non-carbohydrates in particular. And so, uh, yes, there is that one study, um, which showed that there is a significant decrease in the PASI, um, which is the psoriasis severity in a four week period from doing a keto diet, uh, in addition to a significant weight loss that, that has been reported with them. So Absolutely. So a uh, question, so why would, so yeah, what's the basic premise? Why would intermittent fasting improve psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis in the first place? So a couple different things, but uh, part of this is, is calorie restriction in the first place. Um, and so the, the calorie restriction aspect is, is um, we're decreasing. So, so this is a method that is uh, relatively popular right now but it decreases your calories and, and you don't have to make this decision every day, but it's also rigid enough during the 16 hour period that it's easier. So many patients find it easier to restrict their calories that way, rather than going from a 2000 calorie diet every day to 1800. So their, their overall weekly calorie levels are decreased. Um, the second thought of that is that um, the drivers of, of kind of this Western diet in, in general here, where high levels of carbohydrates, especially the high glycemic index foods, processed sugars are associated with systemic inflammation. And so reducing the overall calories that, that people are uh, consuming seem like they've made a difference. And, and then so the kind of the premise that we also use from this is also citing these previous studies that have been done during Ramadan, not controlled, but um, patients that were losing weight during Ramadan also having a significant improvement in the psoriasis as well too. For me, the natural progression was psoriatic arthritis, hence lower metabolism, causing insulin resistance. This pushed me to pre-diabetic. The intermittent fasting helped me move to non-diabetic for the last one year. Uh, weight down five pounds. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm happy that people are actually already doing the intermittent fasting. I, I, I am an intermittent faster as well, too. I do think it's, it's relatively easy to do. Um, and I, I think that's easier for me than, than to say I'm going to consume a specific number of calories every day and keep it at that. Can you recommend any scientific approaches, references to treat, uh, treatment protocols for nutritional interventions? Uh, for pharmacological interventions, there's clear instructions. Take dose X, yeah, five times per interval. For nutrition, do we investigate with the same rigor? Yeah, absolutely. And which quantity or which interval of good nutrients supplements one needs to take to eat for a positive effect? Yeah, which list um, with the recommendations per nutrient do you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is a... Uh, key thing. The, the answer is the answer very clearly is no. None of these nutritional studies are done with the same rigor, the same funding, or same investment that pharmaceutical uh, studies are, are put through. And part of that challenge, you know, probably very honestly, is is that like there's no. Uh, so like if I if I I develop this perfect diet for psoriasis and and psoriasis clears up. You know, it, it it's not that uh, 
everyone can do it. Um, you know, just buy different, you know, buy whatever the, the diet I'm, I'm describing is. And so there's so many variations and there's so many potential variations that can be available. And you put all that together and, and I, I think it's hard, um, uh, hard to get the, the investments that would allow the same kind of rigor that's done in pharmaceutical studies. And so I don't anticipate that it ever really was going to be done to the same degree, unfortunately, which is unfortunate because again, this is something that that's free or, or, you know, it's something you're already paying for in your food. Uh, and it's not something you have to, to actually do. So can you recommend any scientific approaches or references? Um, yes, I, I can. Uh, I, I will direct message you a couple of, of these references if, if that's okay. Uh, I, I put them in the PowerPoint and what I'll do is, I'll, or how about I'll, I'll send them out to everybody, the, the references, if you want to look at, at them and their systematic reviews papers specifically in what was the study at that time was treated. The tricky part about it is you'll see there's four different studies for, for um, intermittent fasting, but they are different. So they were conducted slightly differently. And I will just say, or, or for the Mediterranean diet, um, or for low calorie diet or calorie restrict restriction diets, they are done differently between them and, uh, and the overall rigor. So that kind of control aspect randomization often isn't done. So the, the quality is lower. Thank you for the comments. It went 100%. So we, we have a comment here, I think because we patients all have different triggers and social and financial variations. It would be hard to say this exact thing works for everyone. 100%. I, you know, I think it's hard to, it's hard to disagree with that. Um, it, there's not at all, this does need to be individualized to the patient. Most patients do not have any sort of micronutrient deficiency probably, but we do need to consider patients that, that may. So maybe the psoriasis patient that's been through bariatric surgery. Absolutely. We should be considering that. Um, and still have psoriasis. So 100%, we need to be individualizing this. We have, you know, patients that, that can't, I'd be very concerned for them to do a calorie restriction diet with their, with their current body weight, you know, can't, can't do that. So we need to individualize this. On the other hand, I also have some patients that, that are overweight and are 55 years old. And, uh, you know, I think I can make a huge difference for that patient by talking to them about stopping smoking and, and or stop, uh, uh, losing, uh, five to 10 pounds, uh, not only for their psoriasis, but also for their heart. Yeah. So, so kind of along that same, same lines, I, I have a question about, um, which, which diet do you think works the best or has the best, the best results? I, I can't really make a clear comment here. The most data is for calorie restriction, but calorie restriction can be done in multiple, multiple ways. So um, the gluten-free, keep in mind the gluten-free was, was it's primarily patients that you have to test positive <clears throat> to having the anti, um, the antibodies that, that recognize gluten in the first place. So I wouldn't generally recommend that one. Um, I think some form of calorie restriction is probably the most accessible and you just have to kind of feel that out with the patient and probably has the most amount of data behind it as well too. And to add to that question, what intermittent fasting is the best or easiest to manage? It's different for everybody <clears throat> as far as what that, that fasting window is. Um, I think 16 hours twice twice a week is probably what's done most commonly. And you just have to remember that that does include sleeping. And so it's not that you're starving all day. And, and you may, the first couple of times, be very hungry. And, and, and I should also be cautious. Um, oftentimes, diabetics, especially type 1 diabetics, were not included in these studies over concerns of, of hypoglycemia. So just caution, if you do have diabetes, you do need to be very cautious and have this discussion with your primary care doctor as well. But I think 16 hours is, is very um, reasonable. Um, if you think about it, by the time that you finish dinner, depending on what time you eat dinner, if you eat dinner at five, you're done at six, then you just shut off the, the clock then and you know you can eat by the next day. I, I personally do about 24 hours twice a week is, is my goal. So I stop eating after dinner on Monday and then I don't eat till, till dinner on Tuesday and same thing on Thursday, Thursday night to Friday. But, uh, it, it depends. Everyone's a little bit different. In, easiest to manage. Um, same, same thing. It just depends on what your, what your job is, you know, what days are best for you to do this, um, what your other commitments are. So I think uh, another comment, um, kind of the same thing. I think psoriasis patient, all different track, yeah, different triggers. It's hard to say that that exact same. Yeah, exactly. So then I have another comment about 
needing individualized um, switching sides to negative impact factors, periodontal disease, oral microbiome uh, problems. Do we study the effect sizes, effect delays, and effect durations? Again, of course, optimally for patient subgroups with sufficient rigor per month of periodontal disease. How much of psoriatic arthritis and psoriatic yeah, um, disease get worse? It, 100%. I mean, so we did a systematic review looking at all the papers that are out there. And it's it's very light, uh, you know, when you actually think about it. Um, the fact that I can put all those studies on, on a single slide. So think about any other core morbidity associated. Think about heart disease. And, and, and periodontal disease is also associated with heart disease. If you think about that, how many slides would it take to put heart disease associated with psoriasis studies on there? On the flip side, even though periodontal disease is, is not at all inconsequential, it's not just, you know, having more exposed teeth in the first place and, and you know, fragile teeth that, that can break and fall, fall out because of the lack of gum. But we know that this is associated with systemic inflammation. We know it's associated with heart disease itself. We know it's associated with psoriasis and many other autoimmune diseases as well, too. So uh, 100%, there, there is a, a definitely a deficiency in the rigor of study that's, that's being done uh, connecting oral health in, in driving psoriasis in the first place. Okay. No other health issue and have sleep issues. Try intermittent fasting with fasting evening hours. Have observed excellent sleep myself with this, but make sure intermittent fasting does not mean starving. You'll eat all the good things you eat. Just that in a limited duration, stop munching throughout the day. 100%. You, you said it better than, than I did. That's exactly it. So you can still get to enjoy the things that you enjoy. Um, but there are going to be, you know, the times that you're not actually enjoying it and you're just kind of going throughout the day and snacking when you're not really hungry you're not really enjoying it necessarily. That's what you're really trying to cut out with intermittent fasting, especially. So that, that's that's a perfect way to put it. Thank you, Dr. Kaffenberger. Um, this has been a very, very informative and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I do appreciate all your hard work on that. As we prepare for a five-minute break, I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. Their support and uh, continued support for the National Psoriasis Foundation, it, it helps us have all these conferences and it also helps bring information to our uh, different communities. So as we get ready to take our five minute break here, get up, stretch your legs, uh, maybe get a beverage or a snack or do start planning your intermittent fasting. <laughs> So true. Uh, we will be scrolling through information about National Psoriasis Foundation resources during this break. If you have questions about the resources or anything that you heard today, just type in the chat box and Dana or Audrey, who are working behind the scenes today, will get back to you. And we'll also be sending a post-conference email with all the wonderful resources mentioned in the chat. And with that, enjoy your break.
If you haven't listened already, tune into episode 200 of Sound Bites, the podcast series provided by the National Psoriasis Foundation. Here, Guy, Leah, and Matt discuss their vision for the National Psoriasis Foundation, along with additional information about the National Psoriasis Foundation research activities. And also, Renee and I should be a little biased on this, but also catch out episode number 191, Positives Instead of Negatives, Living with Psoriatic Disease, where she and I will share tips on dealing with stress and living with psoriatic disease. It's a great episode. So catch Sound Bites. Um, the URL is there on the screen, or, or you can listen uh, via your favorite podcast app. Alan, I just, I couldn't agree more. It really is quite a good one. Here today to honor Tom Easygoing and share a few words in memoriam is a lifelong volunteer. I call him my so bro, um, and he is a board member and friend of the National Psoriasis Foundation, Matt Kostelica. Uh Matt, if you would, please, sir. Sure. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for the introduction, Alan. So you see there some very important letters, peace, love, and joy. And we're here today to talk about Tom Easy Goen, who is a longtime member of the foundation. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background here. The first time I ever saw Easy, he was riding a motorcycle on the uh, Walk for a Cure in Dallas. And his beard was flowing in the wind, and he had this cool leather, leather hat that was flapping, and there was this dog sticking head sticking out of his jacket. Easy's motorcycle was a three-wheel motorcycle, which is commonly referred to as a trike. Well, Easy referred to it as a motorcycle with training wheels. And that very much shows you his sense of humor, even at his own expense. He was indeed one of a kind. We frequently speak about people breaking the mold. Well, Easy broke multiple modes. He definitely marched to the beat of his own drum, or he would probably say he limped to it. My wife Kat and I became friends with him and very quickly came to love him. He was truly a diehard road warrior for his causes. He traveled multiple times across the country on his motorcycle with training wheels and his furry companion, Little Buddy, in tow. He would attend those events, trying to raise awareness, providing hope, and he continued to show his sense of humor with his own little acronym. And let me look at my notes so I don't bugger this up. The acronym was PURPLE, which stood for People United Relieving Painful American Lives. Without any appointments, he had the chutzpah to walk into newspaper offices and sit down and try to speak to the reporters. And any reporter worth their salt would take one look at Easy and say, there's a story here. And boy, they wouldn't be disappointed. He lobbied for the foundation in his beloved state of Iowa and in D.C., which is why I'm wearing an NPF advocacy shirt today. And uh, a picture of him with one of his representatives is proudly displayed at the NPF's D.C. headquarters. For all of Easy's efforts, he was awarded the Innovator Award by the foundation. And yet he did all of these things while suffering the dire consequences of living a psoriatic life. He didn't have it easy, despite his nickname, and he endured much. But despite this, he did as much as he could for as long as he could. And through it all, he never lost his sense of humor, and he maintained his love for people and life. And he dearly loved his mom, Jean, and his daughters, Miranda and Brianna, and siblings, and many other folks. And to each of you, thank you for sharing easy with us. And there you go. Love, that's a great way to sum all of this up. Easy ended every correspondence with PLJ, which of course, as the slide shows, stands for peace, love, joy. And he expressed that to his very last. I will miss our friend, but I know he is now riding a motorcycle with no training wheels 
and with little buddy on one side and little buddy's successor freedom on the other. So to you, my brother, I wish you peace and love and joy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for those words. I'm sure peace, love, and joy is something that, you know, we could all use a little bit more of in our lives. And for the next speaker, I'm here today to address the issue of chronic pain and how integrative medicine can help is Dr. Todd Bourne. Dr. Bourne is a naturopathic physician, certified nutrition specialist, owner and medical director of Bourne Investigative Medicine Specialists, PLLC. Dr. Bourne is also the medical wellness advisor for the International Medical Wellness Association and a key opinion leader for AugurX Life Sciences Corp. He is extensively published, has appeared on multiple news and national radio shows, and lectured as an expert for the National Psoriasis Foundation and the Arthritis Foundation. He lectures at medical conferences across the country and internationally. Dr. Bourne's clinical focus is utilizing integrative medicine to treat families of all ages who have complex chronic diseases with a strong interest in difficult and refractory cases of any condition and age. He sees patients all over the U.S. and globally. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Todd Bourne for a discussion about chronic pain types and treatment options. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to share my screen so everybody can see it. So I wanted to thank the National Psoriasis Foundation for inviting me to speak to you. And I have spoken to your group before. It's been a number of years. Uh, I spoke on a different topic, just kind of naturopathic approaches to treating psoriasis and psoriatic disease. And these are my disclosures. And what I hope to teach and convey today really is about the different types of chronic pain and common causes, six major categories, treatment options, and really how multidisciplinary approaches can be utilized to improve overall health outcomes and quality of life. Because that's really what it's all about, right, is, is improving lives, decreasing pain. And I normally give this talk to healthcare providers, sometimes to say the civilians, uh, so to speak, and it's usually about a 90-minute um, presentation. So I have 35 minutes to present to you, so it's going to be uh, – we'll move pretty quickly, but really it's just the salient points of the slides and a 10,000-foot view of uh, the, the information to let you know that there are options outside of pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy should be used, uh, but I use them a little more judiciously than my conventional brethren. So let's look at just some quick depressing factoids. And this data is from 2010. I really couldn't find anything that was newer that really kind of um, isolated really the points quite nicely, which it affects more than 100 million people in the US, 20% of outpatient visits, 12% of prescriptions, and it costs uh, the United States about $100 billion a year in direct and indirect expenses. And these aren't data. It's certainly higher than this because it was 13 years ago, and it's also not data for those individuals who are have their uninsured or underinsured, so they don't go to the doctor to get diagnosed. They just kind of tend to rely on just over-the-counter medications, although pain is a big motivator to get people in to see um, a doctor. Pain-related expenditures, again, you know, it, it actually exceeds cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. You can see how expensive it is. And again, direct costs, lost wages, people missing work, um, how much it burdens the healthcare system, et cetera. And because the way the conventional medical model, the U.S. model is designed, unfortunately, in the insurance-based system is that uh, it's a fee-for-service. So it's the doctors have to see you quicker and quicker and quicker. So your patients, your, your appointments, obviously, as you all know, get truncated down. And it's just easier to write the script and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and I can't say it any better myself, so I'll use this quote. The use and misuse of opioids for management of chronic pain is a major concern with problems arising from their multiple adverse side effects drug dependency, drug diversion, and under-treatment of chronic pain symptoms for the fear of opioid abuse. Chronic pain is thus a major medical and social issue affecting the quality of life, individual patients, their friends, families, workforce, and society in general. So when we really look at these things, at least the way I see it, right, this holistic approach is that one of the first things I'm concerned about or I, I kind of question is what kind of pain is it? So is it neuropathic pain, right? Nerve pain? Is it musculoskeletal pain? Do you have an inflammatory condition like psoriatic arthritis? Do they have an infection, um, you know, like they got a tick-borne illness? They have some kind of arthropathy, which is a joint pain. So I need to understand because opioids, for the most part, are not really anti-inflammatory. They just block your brain's perception of the pain. Mechanical compressive 
right? Do they actually have a compression fracture? Do they get in a car accident? Do they, they get a crush injury? Do they get a, you know, a football injury? And most of the time when people end up having chronic pain, they're actually in uh, multiple categories of pain. This is also key, right? Because pain is very subjective. Some people have very high pain tolerances and some people don't. Women tend to have high pain tolerances than men. So when people come in and we start talking about their pain and I'm trying to elucidate what kind of pain is it, what makes the pain better or worse, you know, all the usual questions. But I'm also like one to 10, zero to 10. Zero, you're in no pain. 10, you're in a lot of pain. What are you averaging? And when, what gets you to 10? And I will ask them this and I'll give them this scale. This is an international pain scale. Scale. And I'll look at the faces because they might say that my pain is 10. And I'm like, well, is it really a 10? And they'll say, oh, well, 10 is worse pain. It means I'm bed rest required. No, I'm actually probably more like a six or seven. It helps me understand how much pain they're in. It also helps them start to normalize that pain. What really is the amount of pain that they're in. And then you got to really look at it, thorough evaluation, comprehensive history of presenting illness, physical exam, standardized pain scales. Um, my practice for the last five years is 100% telehealth. Um, so I don't see patients in person physically anymore. It's all via HIPAA compliant programs. That's how I see people all over the world. So I can't do much physical exam anymore, uh, but I don't, after 13 years of practice, don't need much. And I just refer out for other things things like physiatry. You got to assess psychosocial factors. For example, if they're really stressed out all the time, they're not sleeping well, they're in a toxic relationship, they're in a toxic work environment, their pain is going to be worse, right? Because the mental aspects of pain really with the somatization. What have you tried? What's worked? What's not worked? And why? And I hear this a lot from people. I say, well, yeah, I, I tried um, turmeric. I tried curcumin. It didn't do anything. Well, one of the first things I asked them, you know, they try it for their pain is how much do you take? How many times a day do you take it? How often did you take it? How long did you take it? Where did you get it? Because I did look at the National Psoriasis Foundation website and there is a misnomer saying that the dietary supplement industry is not regulated by the FDA. And that's not true. It is actually regulated by the FDA. It's poorly enforced. That's the difference. That's why you can get a lot of supplement companies out there. And most honestly, they're, they're just not very good. They're garbage. So if you have the good stuff that really works, it, it's far more effective. We'll go through that. So again, just kind of, you know, flying through these slides, diagnostic workup. I'm really kind of known as being a vampire because I see a lot of complicated patients, a lot of autoimmune disease, and I'm trying to figure out what is actually going on so I can make inroads to improve the outcomes without having to use a whole lot of steroids or I can start tapering their steroids, tapering their methotrexate, tapering their use of the NSAIDs. So you got standard testing, you got to look at inflammatory markers, hormones, and these are steroid hormones. And remember our steroid hormones, these are physiological steroids, not pharmacological, say like prednisone or betamethasone. So you can actually use these when they're low or even say insufficient, so not frankly low, to help control chronic pain. In 13 years of treating thousands of people with autoimmune diseases and chronic pain, it's very, very rare, unless they're in the beginning stages, that I actually see these, these hormones normal. They're usually pretty low um, because of the fact that a lot of times they're on long-term steroids, you get adrenal suppression, but there's lots of other reasons. Looking at nutrients, many of these might be because they have neuropathic pain and then getting it covered well by insurance using these codes. So now, based upon what they're telling me during their history, I'm starting to think, okay, we got to get a little more advanced, possibly. Do they live in an endemic area that has a lot of tick-borne illnesses like New England or the Midwest? Now, ticks um, for Lyme disease, for example, has been found on every continent but um, Antarctica. So I'm looking at tick-borne infections. I'm looking at treating the gut, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is a breath test. I've seen a lot of people with some bizarre pain syndromes, and they've been referred to me by other clinicians. And it turns out that, you know, after we do all the rule outs, well, I'm like, you might have this. We treat this. And lo and behold, they do better. Heavy metals more tends to, you know, when you start thinking of neuropathic pain or neurological pain. And or if I'm doing and I have my diagnosis and I'm pretty sure that's what's going on and I'm doing a therapeutic intervention interventions and they're adherent to that program, but they're not responding. Something's interfering with why they're not responding, even if it's a medication. So I might start considering heavy metals and mycotoxins, which come from molds that many people clear. Um, they're basically like the spores on the molds, much, much smaller than even a mold. And they can cause problems with people. It's called the great mimicker, similar um, Lyme disease. And then genetics. And 
the reason I run HLA B27 people with chronic pain, um, particularly and also looking at anti-nuclear antibody, looking at autoimmune disease, is just because someone, for example, is HLA B27 positive. It does not mean they have ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, because, but just because they're negative doesn't mean they don't have it. The reason I run these is that if they are positive and they do have one of these conditions right here listed, an HLA B27 positive condition, they actually have a worse prognosis. So the person will have a hastening of their disease. So it's a, important to be more aggressive so you don't get that long-term joint destruction. Other genetics, you know, if someone say you're trying to rule out celiac disease, if someone's on a gluten-free diet, doing serology testing for tissue transcutaneous Aminase and you know deaminated gluten anti gliadin antibodies. You're testing antibodies to gluten, so if they're avoiding gluten, you can have falsely negative results. Genetics, you're born with these and they don't change. So I run these these HLA DQ2 DQ8, and there's a particular lab that I use. I have no affiliation called Prometheus Insurance covers it, and they will actually do the subtypes of the HLA. And they'll tell you the percentage of likelihood that that person will develop celiac disease or is likely to get celiac disease, 50%, 80%. So that also helps them to be more adherent to gluten-free. But look at all these other diseases that are associated with HLA, right? The HLA, DQ2, DQ8 um, phenotypes. Diabetes type 1, Hashimoto's, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. And this may be why some people who have these diseases, but they don't have celiac disease, they respond better on a gluten-free diet. It's because they have some genetic propensity not to be able to degrade gluten and gliadin proteins. And then there's just DR3, which um, we're not talking about today. So this is an important little factoid, right? Because it's a negative feed forward cycle, right? People who are in chronic pain, they're more likely to have depression and anxiety, about 75% of people, which then further exacerbates their pain syndromes. So is it the chicken or the egg? I usually will ask people, before all this pain stuff happened, did you tend to have, be a more anxious person, tend to have some depression? And they'll tell you, yeah, I've always been kind of a worrier. They also have insomnia, usually because of the fact they can't sleep because of the pain. And then they have fatigue. So you can see how everything is compounding one another. They can't sleep, which is worsening their pain. And then they're tired, which is worsening their pain. So if you actually do treat get them sleeping better, get their energy improved, and treat their mood, the pain also improves. So if you actually treat them all, you can see this multi-pronged approach, you get better outcomes. And people who have very complex chronic pain syndromes, it's not only me who feels this way. I mean, the data shows this, and we'll show some studies here, that it really needs a multidisciplinary team. And this doesn't mean I'm shunting them to all over the place so they're doing nothing but being in a doctor's office all the time, but I will bring them on as needed. I'm like, sometimes, you know, I don't really know what's going on with your pain. I really need you to see a physiatrist. And I love physiatrists, right? These are medical doctors and osteopaths who are musculoskeletal specialists, and they're not surgeons. So they're trying to keep you out of the surgeon's hands. So if they say, you know, you really need surgery, let's get your orthopedics, you probably do. Versus if you send them to an orthopod, that's their bread and butter, right? They're, they're going to try to convince you to cut you and and fix things not all of them the more time a lot of times they will send you to pt but um my experience is most of the time they're ready to start doing some surgery even if it's you know like debridement for some osteoarthritis of a shoulder so i'm a big fan of these physical therapists occupational therapy but getting someone to the right specialist who can make an accurate diagnosis and then we can then get treatment because sometimes people have chronic pain we're like we don't even know and you just throw the kitchen sink at and wonder why it doesn't work so let's talk about what is typically done and many of you who have psoriatic arthritic disease have been down this road or you're currently in the road because you're being worked up and you're kind of punting in the system so the conventional approach is we're either going to give you pharmacology physical therapy behavioral therapy neuromodulation intervention and surgery and if you actually look if you even combine these for non-cancer pain, the journal Lancet, one of the most prestigious journals in the world, they're actually showing only a 30% reduction in pain, not typically very stellar. So then you have pharmacotherapy, and that's the most widely used because it's the quickest. And look at the classes of drugs. Again, I'm not knocking these. There's a time and a place for everything. They just need to be used more judiciously. So you got non-opioids, opioids, alpha-2 injuries. I mean, the list goes on, muscle relaxers, et cetera, et cetera, the DMARs, the steroids. Particularly people who have autoimmune disease, it's like, well, 
let's start you on a DMR or a biologic, you know, we'll kind of pick our favorite one. And then if you, hopefully you tolerate it and it works and you don't build tolerance, you don't build antibodies, you don't have side effects. Okay, we can go to a different class. We'll give you a TNF blocker. Oh, that didn't work. Well, let's give you a JAK inhibitor. Let's give you an IL-17. Let's give you an IL-23A. You know this is, you see where this is going. Um, not very scientific and strategic systematic approach like the, I like to do it. And here's the standard of care, right? Is here is actually how you're supposed to have meds prescribed. Mild pain, non-opioids with some adjuvant there. Mild to moderate chronic pain, right? The more pain you have, then you start intervening. Because of what happened a few years ago with the that came into the media of the overuse and abuse and overprescription of opioids, people are using these more judiciously, but I still see them prescribed, say, too easily, too readily when someone doesn't really need an opioid. Despite significant progress, chronic pain remains refractory to treatment. Only one-third to two-thirds of patients reporting a greater than 50% pain relief. More of our first-line drugs, NSAIDs, and opioids are associated with adverse dose-limiting side effects, dependence, and tolerance. So this verbose way of saying is that you get the drug, but the drug, the body builds tolerance to it, has a lot of, and you need more and more of it. You can also become physically dependent, as we all know. And once you get too high of, of, of a dose, then you start worrying about some pretty severe consequences. That's also why I like pain specialists, right? If someone has chronic pain, because they really know how to use these medications versus the primary care provider that doesn't typically have advanced training in these kind of medications. Here's a study that just came out in Lancet uh, in July, which was actually surprising even to someone like me who tends to be a little more skeptical about any intervention. They showed that opioid analgesia for acute low back pain and neck pain, not chronic pain, in a randomized placebo-controlled trial to the gold standard actually did not work. It was no more effective than placebo. But what are people getting prescribed all the time? Acute pain, chronic pain, opioids. Again, time and place for everything. So here's my world, right? The integrative approach and studies here, even out of the journal rheumatology showed that when you're using multiple uh, therapies, you actually have improved outcomes and you get much greater than that 50%. And you can usually get people's pain significantly under control. And I love how this guy looks like he dropped a hammer on his thumb. So maybe he's in some chronic pain as well. And the key for me is evaluation of the cause. So first of all, what kind of pain and what is the cause of your pain? Is it no susceptive pain? Do you have damage to the tissue? Is it neuropathic pain? Do you have a herniated disc? Do you have a crush injury that's pressing on your nerve? What is it that's going on? Why do you have this, this, these neuropathies? Do you have diabetes, et cetera? You've got to find the cause. In, in naturopathic, one of our tenants is tole cause, treat the cause. Integrative interventions, right? And we'll just fly through these just to know. It doesn't mean you should be going out and self-medicating and, you know, saying, oh, Dr. Born slide, I should try all these things. It's not um, really very advisable because it might backfire on you. I just want to let people know, the general public and any healthcare providers, that there are literally limitless less options. When people come and see me for chronic pain, or autoimmune disease, and they've seen everybody, I'll tell them, and they're feeling despondent and desperate. I'll say, look, you will get tired of seeing me before I run out of options. And that's generally very, very true um, because it'll take me a long time to run out of options for you. And if I haven't gotten any you know, inroads in, say, six months, I'm usually going to end up referring them to another doctor, not necessarily just someone for a workup, but for someone for treatment, because I might be missing something. So you got hydrotherapy and balneal therapy. So everybody knows what hydrotherapy is, right? Halting hot and cold, um, things like that. Balneal therapy is more used in Eastern Europe and it's been around for centuries. And that's kind of where they go in. They're using different types of water, different types of bath, different types of salinity. And these are, I've, I've been to Europe and I've been to these, their bathhouses, um, not just for, you know, relaxation. Like here's one. I mean, who wouldn't be relaxed sitting in a place like this? I think this is Iceland. But um, showing this is actual conventional therapy. Doctors refer these for people to these clinics for treatment, these spas, because they're like, let's try all these things before we just start giving you a bunch of NSAIDs that damage your kidneys, damage your, um, give you ulcers, have cardiovascular effects long term, damage the liver, et cetera. Physiotherapy is just any manual therapy, and that's a laundry list infrared, low level laser, right? Chiropractic, the TENS unit, the list goes on and on and on. They're, um, they're very effective. And even so much in 2017, the American College of Physicians said, low oh, back pain. You should be doing spinal manipulation, heat massage, and acupuncture for anything else. But yet, 
that's their guidelines and that's rarely followed. And then you got electrotherapy, right? E-STEM, ultrasound, low-level laser, those kind of things. I'm not a huge fan of this E-STEM units. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the TENS units, because those are the little boxes you have, you put on an area of pain, they only work as long as they're being turned on. They don't have, they're not like interferential and some of these electrotherapy instruments that actually have long-term positive effects. And the previous speaker was, um, had big on diet. Um, and here's my stance on diet, right? There's a lot of evidence that the anti-inflammatory diet, which is just, you know, whole foods, plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, no artificial colors, flavorings, no sugars, you know, eating a healthy diet, improves outcomes. And here was a study that came out of Cleveland Clinic a few years ago where they either gave people a sham diet or the allergy elimination diet. And that includes removing the most commonly suspected foods that cause inflammation. And there is a difference between a food allergy, a food sensitivity, and a food intolerance. They are not the same thing. So for example, a true food allergy is where you eat, you know, the seafood, the shrimp, and your face blows up, or you get a scratchy mouth, or you get hives all over, you go become anaphylactic. That is a type one IgE mediated hypersensitive reaction where you need, you know, diphenhydramine and an EpiPen possibly if you become anaphylactic. A food intolerance is not mediated by the immune system. You do not get, get extra gastrointestinal manifestations. In other words, you eat the gluten and you get a bunch of gas and bloating, but that's mediated by an enzyme insufficiency or deficiency. It's not an allergy. Then and there's the world that a lot of people live in are food sensitivities. Those may or may not be mediated by the immune system. So that's why you have non, uh, you can have celiac disease, but it's, it's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You still, you might get IgG mediated antibodies and you can get delayed reactions. And the only way to really know those um, is the allergy elimination diet is the gold standard. You can also do IgG food testing. But the evidence for that is best in migraine, chronic migraines, IBS, uh, and eosinophilic esophagitis. But I could tell you in, again, the thousands of people I've had with autoimmune diseases and chronic pain, ultimately, at one point, they will go through the allergy elimination diet, and I have them give them a diet diary, and you will see outcomes, psoriasis improves, pain improves, inflammation improves. It's because those foods they are sensitive to, and they may or may not be made by immune system. Even in this study, they showed a 30 to 40% reduction in pain with the allergy elimination diet. That's better than standard therapies of, con of conventional therapies. And then there's homeopathy, right? Another great thing because homeopathy has no interactions and it has no side effects. And it's been around for almost 200 years. And the way humans work, right? If it doesn't work, we get rid of it. And even here in The Lancet, they said that homeopathy is more than just a placebo effect. But I can tell you, again, um, if you want to have people stop their flares before they go into flare, mitigate flares, you give them their homeopathic medicine, um, and it stops pretty much 100% of the time, stops them going into a flare or mitigates it substantially. And here was a study, right, because everybody likes studies, you know, particularly conventional docs. They're just like, well, is there any proof? Here's just one study where they had a bunch of surgery patients and they gave them Arnica or NSAIDs. And here you can see that um, Arnica was just as effective as the anti-inflammatories with no side effects. And we know the problems with NSAIDs, at least long-term use. What about botanicals? This is where naturopathic medicine can shine really well is because the advantage of botanical medicines, right, is that they tend to be multi-mechanistic. So they work on multiple mechanisms versus many conventional drugs, usually are just mono-mechanistic. And many conventional drugs, we don't even know how they work. Just look them up. It'll say, you know, suspected mechanism of action or complete mechanism unknown. So when people say, oh, you don't know how naturopathic or natural therapies work or herbs work, I said, sure we do. I mean, here's studies all over the place and you don't know how your drug, your medications work. But there are classes of these. So you can give people the analgesics, you can give people antiarthritics, you know, these, there's more antiarthritics. And what's nice is that some botanicals have affinities for different areas of the body. So if someone's got low back pain or joint pain, I might start giving them something like Harpagophytum percumbens, which is devil's claw, cat's claw, ginger, right? I mean, these are very, very effective and very, very low side effect profile. And the men, many times the reason people say, well, these don't work is because they're not taking enough of it. So if someone has psoriatic arthritis and they're in chronic pain, using 500 milligrams of a really low absorbed low bioavailable turmeric 
isn't going to do it. For prevention, that's one thing. You're starting to getting into like the 3,000 milligram dose of super bioavailable forms of these herbs. And then again, you got the antispasmodics. And a lot of times to get enough into people, I use tinctures, liquids. Otherwise, they're just taking 16 pills a day and the pill burden is a bit much. So, um, and I'll mix these. The, the pain herbs are usually pretty uh, horrible tasting. But again, pain's a big motivator. I tell people get some pomegranate juice or some conquer grape juice, and you're going to take a teaspoon of this mix three times a day, and I add a whole bunch of herbs in there, and it works um, usually pretty quickly. There's adaptogens and nervines. You know, adaptogens are good because they help with that stress component, and some of these now are showing like bethania, which is ashwagandha. A lot of people recognize that one. They're showing efficacy in um, chronic pain syndromes, probably by modulating certain neurotransmitters that uh, modulate pain. And then the immune millimodulators, these are for people that I use a lot when they're on, say, a DMARD or a biologic, and it works pretty well. They might be coming in for me for breakthrough pain, or, or they tolerate the drug really well, but they're always sick because their immune system is depressed. Well, then we start talking about, well, don't mess with the med because it's working, but let's get it so you can t um, not be sick all the time and catch every cough and cold that's going around the room. Then I start thinking of immune modulators. There is some concern that if you're someone with an immune disease, you give them immune stimulants, that it's going to exacerbate their immune system. That's theoretical. We haven't seen it in humans. So I pulse them anyway, just, you know, err on the side of caution. I'm like, take these money through Friday or the cold and flu season's coming up. But there's also immune modulation versus immune stimulation. And these are immune modulators. They modulate how the immune system works. So um, they're not overly stimulating them with like a bunch of polysaccharides or something. What about vitamins? Yes, vitamins do work. And again, they're at much, much higher doses than you think about. And people will freak because they'll be like, this is 2000% of my daily value. Right, because we're not doing the daily value and the RDAs that are set by um, the government agencies. Those are the minimum amount of a nutrient you need to prevent a particular disease. Like 10 milligrams, for example, of vitamin C, ascorbic acid to prevent scurvy. Well, we're not pirates anymore. We don't get scurvy, but you can use much, much higher doses, like a thousand milligrams three times a day for acute viral infections. And studies prove that mostly in children um, and athletes, but still works nonetheless. Vitamin E, right? And here's the mechanisms. I'm not going to read them to you and put you to sleep, but you can see vitamin D. And the reason I'll just pause in, on vitamin D for a minute is that I see vitamin D grossly over prescribed by most clinicians, conventional, functional medicine, integrated medicine, naturopathic medicine, the human body has natural shutoff mechanisms for vitamin D. And these studies that have been done in Hawaiian um, lifeguards where they don't give them any sunscreen, they stick them out in the sun for 45 minutes all summer, then they put the sunscreen on, and they'll me measure their blood levels. Their blood levels rarely, if ever, go above 45 nanograms per mil because the body doesn't need more vitamin D than that. It just shuts it off. It produces metabolites, so it binds up the active D. Most of the studies out there, right, they're all retrospective studies. You know, there, there are observational studies. And, you know, I know there's D experts out there that disagree with me, but once you start getting into this, like, the 80s and 90s and 100, which people erroneously believe they should be on, autoimmune disease or not, anti-aging, whatever, you're actually more likely to get arterial sclerosis, hardening of your arteries, uh, kidney stones and bladder stones, and that's usually from hyperabsorption of calcium. But again, you don't need um, to be blasting people way above that. Once you and it is, you know, a fat soluble vitamin, so you also got and it's activated in the liver, so you got to give it time to show up in the blood tests. Uh, but it is very important. I'm not saying don't give it to them, but pair it with vitamin K2, not K1, K2, and it helps balance out calcium effects. But you're really not going to get any better, greater benefits from. 35 to, you know, or 45 to 60. There's no evidence for it when it shows harm, actually. And here's some studies that prove my point. We got minerals, right, that are very important. Um, boron, calcium, magnesium, particularly in chronic pain. I love giving people calcium, magnesium uh, before bed. It's calming, helps them sleep better, you know, improves uh, their pain pictures. There's amino acids. And it doesn't mean I'm giving everybody everything at once. I'm like, okay. First, let's find out what you have, what kind of pain, what's the cause of the pain. And let's do these couple things first, you know. And I'm usually doing multidisciplinary physical therapy, maybe some chiropractic, some nutrient support, maybe some injections, and the list goes on and on.
And then there's essential fatty acids, right? Again, a lot more than one would normally ever think of because we're treating chronic pain. And you can make these work like steroids, you know, by giving people as much. In the media now, you're seeing some evidence of atrial fibrillation with high dose omega-3 fatty acids. It's not that common. I've done this for 13 years and I haven't seen it, doesn't, but it does make me a little more cautious with giving people massive doses for prolonged periods. But typically what I'm doing is giving people massive, massive doses, you know, talking five, 10 grams, which you can really only get in liquids of a high quality fish oil. I'll give that to them for a few months. And once we get pain under control, I'm tapering down, also watching for easy bruising or bleeding, and then adding in these other essential fatty acids because they also help with pain syndromes. And I usually rotate the oils every three months to work on different cytokines. Then there's these other ones, right? They have good evidence for, you know, um, neuropathies, glutathione, just because your body becomes depleted with glutathione. It's the most important antioxidant. Uh, I usually give it to people at bedtime, um, particularly if they're on a lot of medications. I'm like, because your liver is just overloaded and you'll see their liver enzymes go up. And I'm like, well, we got to balance all this out. One of my favorite things, now we're talking about resistant cases, proteolytic enzymes, and I use this a lot, and I just purposely threw in a whole bunch of studies because I like proteolytic enzymes. They're plant-based enzymes. You can also get them as animal-based. And the key to these is they have to be taken away from food, and they need to be some kind of enteric coating so they don't get degraded by the stomach acid, and they get released from the small intestine, and they bind up immune complexes, and they work very well. Um, and... Uh, there's only one brand I've found. I have no affiliation with that company that I can get enough into people that they don't get noxious. But lots of studies in rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, cancer, um, induced pain. And they're very effective. And I have just used these. I had a patient who had rheumatoid arthritis. Just giving her proteolytic enzymes in the allergy elimination diet, she went off methotrexate um, and her TNF blocker. And then, she was just, then we started tapering on prednisone. So she's off, she'll be off prednisone pretty soon. Let's look at hormones. Again, we talked about that in the beginning with me testing these hormones. And I like the schematic because it's easy for everybody to visualize that you have cholesterol. And then all of our steroid hormones, testosterone, estrogen, pregnenolone, they're all made from cholesterol. They're all cholesterol backbones. So when I have patients who say maybe on statins and their cholesterol is just driven into the ground, but they're not diabetic and they haven't had an adverse cardiovascular event, I'm like, why is your cholesterol so low? They don't even have enough cholesterol to make these hormones. So I'm like, well, why do we got to reconsider why are you on so much statin? And, you know, and then statins can cause fatigue and muscle cramps and things like that, muscle pain, um, worsening their, their pain syndromes. So I'm dosing these, and some of these are over the counter. Again, I wouldn't recommend you just grabbing DHEA or pregnenolone unless you need it. And they are tend to be either steroid hormones, so there's poor oral absorption, so they need to be some kind of fat and micronized when they make small molecules. And then these are a prescription. And I will test people on all these with chronic pain, and then eventually, you know, we'll probably end up giving them some hormones so they feel better, and then taper them off the hormones. I don't like leaving people on hormones unless they need it. And I don't like leaving on long term. I get a lot of patients. I have one right now who has psoriatic arthritis, and she was like, um, she's a nurse practitioner, and they were like, she's like, well, what about cannabidiol, CBD? I've heard that can be good. And here's kind of the the spiel on CBD, right? Is that I don't like just CBD because number one, that's not what's found in nature, and that's not what's found in the humans. We have multiple receptors: CBD, CBG, CBC, CBA, CBB. Most of the studies just in the last five years, right, are on CBD, but we're understanding a little bit more how some of these other receptors interact. But you still need something that is standardized to CBD to know how to dose it. So these doses are really 10 to 160 milligrams, you know, um, short course, you can go above that. But there was a good study here that just came out in the regulatory um, Journal of Toxicology and Pharmacology, where they have a nice synopsis if you have liver disease, no liver disease, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, like what's a safe range? And I, in my experience, those who tend to be a little more anxious tend to do better with CBD when it comes to pain control. And I usually start people with 10 milligrams breakfast and 10 milligrams of dinner with the fish oils because that works on the body's endogenous endocannabinoid system. So you get a, um, it's called the entourage effect. You're getting uh, basically the one enhances the other. So you can go on a lower dose. And really how it works is it depends on the receptor target throughout the body, um, but they can be very good. But again, very low 
absorption. So they need to be in some kind of fat um, for your body to, to absorb it well. And um, drawback, expensive, and insurance doesn't cover it. So for me, you know, in these tough cases, right, I'm like, people are an onion. I'm peeling away layers. They're 50% better. They're 60. They're 70. Well, I want to get you 100, right? That's your goal. That's why you hired me. Uh, nobody should live in, in, in chronic pain. My wife has ankylosing spondylitis, so I know what it's like to live with people who have chronic pain. I'm a big fan of the, the, the topicals, right? The creams, the lotions, the potions, the gels, the patches, pharmaceutical otherwise. Um, these are tissue cell salts that I've just seen work really well in neuropathic pain. We talked about neurological pain um, and the proteolytic enzymes. And then psychological, right? We start talking about people and it's depressing to be in pain all the time, right? I mean, well, I'm like, well, depending on their personality, I might say, you know, have you, you thought about a support group or psychotherapy or, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, something, because the brain's receptivity to pain, if you start undoing there's no connections, pain improves, mood improves, sleep improves, positive feed forward cycle. And again, liver kidney support, um, because if you look at acetaminophen, right, it's the number one cause, which is Tylenol. It's the number one cause of acute liver failure in the United States. And when I was rotating in the emergency rooms in my residency, there were um, our seniors, a couple of them came in because what ends up happening is, is that maybe they got some chronic pain. So they're on some Tylenol-3 um, with, you know, some codeine. And then, you know, they were taking some Tylenol for their pain, which Tylenol is not even that great of a pain reliever. It's a great antipyretic, but not until you get to like these 2,000, 3,000 milligram levels does it even do much for pain. And now you're starting to get into that threshold that you shut down your liver. I, I, I don't really even like it. I end up switching people to them. But giving people liver and kidney support so they process these medications better. And again, treating the gut because the gut microbiome, as we're understanding more and more, modulates a lot of our immune system, modulates a lot of our neurotransmitters, which is pain um, sensitization, pain interpretation. So you got to clear it. Particularly, I have never seen a skin condition, any skin condition, autoimmune or otherwise, that didn't have a gut component to it or a food and a food component. So once we clean up the gut, once we get rid of the food sensitivities and tolerance allergies, people will be 50 or 60% better. In my clinical experience, studies show this as well just by those two interventions alone. Then we start thinking about mitochondrial dysfunction, regenerative therapies, which again, these are people that I'm like, they're 85% better, 90% better, but they've been seeing me for eight months. I'm like, you know, we might start thinking about some of these other things like protein, uh, proline-rich peptides, prolotherapy, ozone, prolozone. These are injection therapies. They are safe if you have someone who's certified in them. Drawback is you usually need a fair amount of them. Um, I use a lot of sports medicine docs for these and insurance does not cover them. And you might need 12 treatments of them and pony up some pretty big dough. So that's another conversation we need to have. We're kind of getting here to the end. So hopefully um, I can give you plenty of time to answer questions. These are medications that I like to prescribe. So again, I do prescribe them, right? Judicious use of prednisone. You got to stop that gorilla, you know, who's already pushing that bus down the hill or getting ready. Right, they're like the Tasmanian devil to the three-year-old, like mine, coming in just to rampaging. It's prednisone time. We gotta hit the brakes. And then muscle relaxers, I do use them a fair amount because I gotta get people to sleep. Short course, thinking about addiction potential, I might give them 15 days worth, a week worth, no refills. I'm not gonna just be like, yeah, here's a month, here's an open prescription for a bunch of, you know, addictive substances. That again, these aren't anti-inflammatory, but I gotta undo things while we do all these other naturopathic things. I'm a big fan of diclofenic. It's an NSAID, comes as a large patch. You can cut it. It's really good for people that have like mono, isolated areas of pain because you can't cover them. And terrible oral medication causes all sorts of problems, but great as a patch with little to no systemic absorption. The nausea, some people are in so much pain, they're taking so many things, they're nauseous, so then they can't even take the meds, they can't take the supplements, they can't take the herbs because they're too sick. So the homeopathics aren't working, I'll just start giving them. And NSAIDs, right, I do use NSAIDs. It's amazing what happens is when you get people off of their naproxen or their um, ibuprofen, et cetera, or their meloxicam, 
and then you do all these other things and then just occasionally breakthrough pain. It might be like take 600 milligrams of ibuprofen or take 500 milligrams of naproxen. They're just like, oh my God, I couldn't believe how much this medication worked this time. I was on that for a year, didn't do anything. It's because we fixed all the other things and you also went off of it until your tolerance went down. And then there's LDN, um, <clears throat> which you can't give if someone's on an opioid because it blocks opioids, uh, the receptors. And so it blocks opioids effects. Uh, I've really seen this work better for neurological disease and people with multiple sclerosis. Um, I haven't seen it do all that. I know there's lots of studies in psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, but I personally haven't seen it work all that well. So it's not something I go to right away. So here really, what is that, you know, whirlwind tour I gave you, the crash course on chronic pain, right? You got to treat the cause. You got to find the triggers. Then it's always going to be a food or foods. It's going to be some kind of stressful thing, you know, um, and uh, sensitivity and tolerance, one of those kind of things. And we got to remove those because now we stop the flares because they're not triggering their flare anymore. Multifaceted, multi-targeted, multi-team, multi-mechanistic approach works best for these, not just monotherapies. And you got to be systematic and triage. Otherwise, it's just really convoluted. It's really overwhelming. And people are like, whoa, my treatment plan's got 13 things. And I could barely get out of bed. I, no, I can't do all that. Um, be systematic, triage, right? Sometimes people see me. Even for the first visit, I'm like, we're going to give you prednisone. And this is why, this is how much I'm going to give you. And then we're going to do these things. Um, don't be afraid to bring in collateral help. A lot of doctors get possessive. and They don't want to send anybody out to anybody. But the patient will, it, it'll pay yourself in spades because they're going to tell everybody how great you were. And you send them to someone who's able to help or diagnose. And then look at the dosages, right? You got to do a lot more in the beginning. And then when people's pain goes down, then you kind of taper it to less and less. And so from that, we'll open it up to Q&A. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Bourne, for your presentation. As a patient population that commonly suffers from chronic pain, this is such valuable information to have. Right. So as you said, it's now time for our Q&A session. Um, the first question we had was from Raghu Singh. And it was requesting if you have a preferred reference to do proper food elimination. Someone, excuse me, like me, you're a dietitian. Someone knows how to do it. But there's a lot of decent resources. It's it's pretty simple. So due to the allergy elimination diet, um, you remove the most commonly inflammatory foods with people uh, for two weeks because that's enough for it to clear out of the system and then you challenge them. And then the inflammatory foods, if you Google it, it'll come up, but it's soy, corn, gluten, uh, dairy, and, and eggs. Um, so life kind of sucks for two weeks when you're avoiding all of these things, but now with all of the a question in the free and Dixon, all these foods, it tastes better. It's uh, pretty your easy. It's pretty easy to stay away from like for two weeks. And then it is important to keep a journal because then you're going to challenge a food but you have to wait 72 hours after challenging that food. And the way to challenge it, you want to do it in its whole form. So if you're going to challenge gluten, you get 100% whole wheat, organic toast or bread. And you're going to eat it with breakfast, you're going to eat it with lunch, and you're going to eat it with dinner. And then you wait three days for a reaction because there are delayed sensitivities. And if after – so it's four days total. If you don't react to anything – then you're unlikely to react to that food. You can consider it safe. And those reactions can be anything. If your joint inflamed, you get a headache, you know, um, you get a bunch of diarrhea, you're like, that's a positive challenge. Uh, if you eat the whole wheat toast for breakfast and all of a sudden your joints flare up, there's no reason to keep – that's a positive reaction. You don't need to keep eating it and keep torturing yourself. The only time it can be a bummer is if you do the allergy elimination diet and you start reacting to a food each – every time you challenge a food, it can make the allergy elimination diet go on for months. And when that happens, I usually just tell people if you've reacted to your third food in a row, you should not be keep reacting. Just stop it. There's something else going on. Um, IgG food testing can be helpful, particularly with children because you can get um, you know, a much better view of what's going on. Because children are hard to put on the allergy elimination diet. They go to school. They eat other kids' food. They don't like it. Um, and also, I, IgG testing can be helpful because it, you know, you can test for 100 foods at once. Doing the allergy elimination diet will take you a lifetime. But um, really, you need either a nutritionist or a naturopathic doctor or someone who's familiar with it to walk you through. But the journal is key. I have a little Excel spreadsheet that has you know items at the top, and then they just journal it. Uh, particularly men, right? We're not very self-aware sometimes. So when they bring back in the journal, they'll say to me, 
I did the whole thing. I didn't notice the difference. And then I'll go to the journal. I'm like, but here on when you challenged dairy, you told me you had a bunch of gas and bloating and your eczema flared. Oh yeah, I guess that did happen. So it is important to keep the journal um, and try to find something that's pretty simplistic uh, online. But most of them are pretty pretty straightforward. But they do need to be removed for two weeks and then challenged one at a time, waiting four days. Another question slash comment from Argu Singh, uh, reading lots of content on vitamin K2 to reduce the harm from vitamin D. Vitamin D is now sort of unavoidable given the amount of food it's fortified into. Yeah, that's a good point. So, but most of the fortified foods are ergocalciferol, which is vitamin D2, not vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is about 30% as effective as vitamin D3. Uh, um, and <clears throat> we don't even know the bioavailability of it. Vitamin K2 is important, and it depends on if it's MK7 versus MK4, right? They're, they're different as far as milligrams versus micrograms, and I'll, I'll you know, spare you those details. But they do need – they should be taken together. Um, but once people start getting into these vitamin D levels, like they've been taking 10,000 for months of IUs or 25,000, um, and vitamin D is very genetically driven. I've seen people that can get to 45 nanograms per mil. Also, to where we live, I live in the Pacific Northwest, right? During the winter, it could be a sunny day, but you still won't produce D um, versus living like in Arizona or something or Florida. But once you get really, really high amounts, right? And, and some people only need a thousand, some people need 5,000. Once your blood levels become a certain level, it doesn't matter how much K2 that person consumes, it doesn't seem to offset those um, arteriosclerotic. Uh, adverse effects from that amount of D. And there's some other problems with having that much D. Um, I just, I had a, I had a patient that was sent to me and he had uh, some leg cramps and he's got celiac disease and fatigue. He's got a, he's a teenager. His vitamin D was 110. And I was like, why is your vitamin D so high? And he said, well, that's what my functional medicine doctor said it should be. And I was like, well, one reason you probably have muscle cramps is because of the fact that you're absorbing too much calcium. So you're kind of getting some tetany um, and fasciculation. So we had him stop his vitamin D for a month and those went away. What well, wasn't rocket science, but anyway, yeah, you, you, they should be used in combination. But once you get your blood levels too high, it doesn't matter how much K2 you take, still have adverse uh, events long term. A question in the chat from Gene Dixon uh, What is your opinion on osteoporosis meds like Fosamax? So I treat a lot of osteoporosis, right? And that's one of the side effects for people on long term prednisone. They're fine, um, they're not great. Right. I mean, there's data right, when people are on things like the bisphosphonates more than five years, they have uh, your, your bone is actually the bone that you're laying down um, is more porous than if you weren't on the medications. So the key to using things, the bisphosphonates or some of these newer medications that seem to work on, you know, osteo uh, class activity or mitigating osteoblast, the breakdown of the bone, you still need to build bone. In order to build bone, you need a number of things. Bone is a living tissue. So it's calcium and magnesium and zinc and boron. And, and I have a whole osteoporosis thing that I a talk that I give as well as a supplement I give people because just taking the medication will not build up your bone and a stronger bone. Uh, and then also, then it's particularly people who are severe osteoporotic, right? They got the Dowinger hump and, you know, they step off a curb and they'll get a compression fracture, right? The concern is that you fall, you break a hip, and then we all know the health outcomes once you break a hip. I mean, it's, you know, not great. Is then also looking at a person's house, right? Making sure there's not things that people can trip on, rugs, you know, um, really that's a key component. It's a non-drug way. And I was then doing weight-bearing exercise. So it needs to be weight-bearing, the supplements, and sometimes a medication, depending on how bad their osteoporosis is. Another question from the chat uh, from Chris Bennett. What is your recommended dosage of glutathione? All depends on the person's size, their weight. I typically give P and glutathione is another lowly, poorly absorbed molecule. Um, so you got to get one that is high bioavailability if it's in a liposome or it's in some kind of, if it's acetylated, acetylglutathione is better absorbed than L-glutathione. I usually give, I usually give people a thousand milligrams at bedtime. And the reason I like giving it at bedtime is because bedtime, when you sleep, that's the body's ability to regenerate. That's when nerve growth factor, um, brain derived neurotropic factor is high. And so I'm helping that along by giving it something like glutathione. In young kids, it's hard to get them to swallow 
glutathione doesn't taste good, right? It, it smells any of these thiol molecules like lipoic acid, glutathione. They they smell like burnt tires, rotten eggs. You can actually get cream, a transdermal cream. They're by compounding pharmacists. That you, can, I like to put creams in the axilla because there's a lot of lymphatic tissue that absorbs right in, so you can use those. But if it's oral, I'll give people a thousand milligrams at bedtime. Thank you so much again, Dr. Bourne. This has been a really fantastic session. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Thank you. Take care. Uh, our next session is focused on partners of people living with psoriatic disease. So please welcome Dave Soretti of Pennsylvania and Raymond Perez of California, who will share about their relationships and some of the challenges of loving someone with a chronic illness. Moderating our panel today will be licensed professional counselor, Mary Marventano Street. Mary, who is based in Chicago, specializes in chronic illness and disease prevention, which addresses the mental and physical components of one's overall health and wellness. Mary is very familiar with the impacts of stress and psoriasis, and psoriasis impacts her family as well. Welcome to today's awesome panel. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Hello. I'm very excited to be here to moderate this uh, partner panel. Um, as it was mentioned in the um, introduction, I have uh, a personal experience with psoriasis and had raised a child since the age of seven years old, who is now almost 43, with uh, moderate to severe uh, psoriasis. So it has a big impact on my family as a person as well as a uh, caregiver. So I'd like to welcome uh, Raymond and David uh, to the panel. And I was wondering if you gentlemen would be interested to tell us a little bit about yourself in the management of uh, being a caregiver or a partner to a person with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Okay, uh, Ray, would you like to go first? Um, sure, I'll take uh, the first one. Uh, no, okay. I think I think the the number one thing is communication through uh, through uh, you and your partner, a hundred percent. Okay, and. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you when you were dating your wife um, related to um, psoriasis and what that was like for you as being a partner with a person dealing with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Um, when we first started dating, she was very, uh, she didn't want to show me it, thinking it may have, uh, you know, turned me off of, of her or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. She really uh, she found out shortly after that that none of that bo bothered me at all and i i was uh ignorant to the fact of what psoriasis was so she you know taught me a few things and let me know how it affected her and, and everything like that and how i could help her out with with uh what she's going through and things of that nature yes and since then you two have married and yes so you're a lot more familiar with what it is like to deal with um, the psoriatic disease as it relates to Tammy. Okay. David? So my wife, Tammy, was diagnosed with psoriasis before we got together. She was diagnosed with psoriasis in 96, I believe. We got together. We've been together since 2000. Um, and uh, so we've, uh, I've, I've, ridden the whole gamut with everything that she's she's gone through she was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis in 2008 um ups and downs uh you know uh, somebody earlier mentioned uh the tar stuff that you put in your hair she went through that um there were time there was a time where she was a member of curves but um you know uh, as she was working out at, at the curves and uh she, uh, her ankles started just started going crazy with her. She she ended up going to uh, her doctor, and then she was with a rheumatologist. Who uh, this rheumatologist, quite frankly, didn't help her out at, at, at all. She's uh, um, I'm sure there are folks out there that have gone to your doctor where it doesn't matter what you say; they're not really listening. 
uh, I'm sure it's out there. Um, and there are great people out there as well. But um, so from the time that she was working on the curves, um, uh, she she had hurt, hurt her ankles and so she had to walk away from that. And um, she back and forth with doctors for years. And then she was diagnosed uh, with psoriatic arthritis in, in 2008. And then she started going through, uh, uh, well, she went through multiple biologics she was a humera patient i believe for seven years but um anyway uh, essentially um yeah, I, I i'm sorry i i kind of go off on a tangent anyway um you're you're here to support your partner with everything and anything you could be uh there just for a shoulder to cry on you could be there for physical support of anything mental support of anything um you're a pin cushion sometimes let them let them let uh, let let them vent because uh the, you know you folks folks that have this disease you, you know you have a hard enough time trying to keep this stuff to yourself and it's not really good to keep it to yourself in the first place you should like let people let people know and sometimes let people have it and uh i believe raymond and i are uh uh, strong enough guys where we know that, you know, that's, that, it, you're not being attacked. It's not a personal thing. We're, we're here for, um, Jen and Tammy for anything and everything that they go through. Well, thank you. Um, now, Raymond, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how long, um, and give us a little bit more information on Jen? I apologize before I got the names mixed up. Um, uh, Raymond? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, dealing with the um, your partner's um, condition first as, you know, when you were dating and then as you got married and how you have been dealing with this and what you have learned about the psoriasis and about what she is going through. Well, dealing with it, you know, it is a tough uh, subject with them, uh, you know, trying to uh, teach me what's going on with her. You know, I, I just, you know, when we first started dating, I didn't understand what, what what it was or anything like that. Or I didn't know how to take care of it. And I, I know, knew nothing about uh, psoriasis to begin with. Um, So, you know, she taught, walked me through it and uh, she was letting me know, like, you know, it does affect her in a lot of ways um what with pain and pain management and things of that nature is getting now to the point where i you know i help her with her uh her injections and things of that, of that nature and um you know really listening to you know what's how she's feeling um above all that how she's feeling how I, what i could do to help her more often you know whether it's you know running errands for her because she just doesn't feel like doing anything or whether I, you know, get her up to make her do stuff, you know, <laughs> it, it's just, you know, got to get her, got to get her out there as well. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's a rough road, but you know, one that I'm glad I, I'm taking with her in this journey and I'm well, happy to help. I have a question about um, how often do you talk with uh, your loved one about what they are going through or that you are experiencing emotionally? in relation to psoriatic disease. Is that for me or for uh since you're here, you first. <laughs> uh we we try to talk um I've, honestly on the on a daily basis just for like a maybe a vague question like how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, uh every morning how how do you feel? You know how how's the pain? Is there any pain at all? You know, uh, stuff like that. You know, just brief little things like that. I, I find help helps her a lot too. Helps her deal with whatever's going on. And then, you know, of course, uh, we 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 work hectic schedules, so we're not always together. So it's even where I'm up and I'm driving to work, and I give her a phone call to see how she's doing. You know, she might be asleep or something like that, but you know, just to see how, just to you know, get that let let get that voice in. To let her know that I am thinking, and you know, I want to know if she's doing okay. You know that help. That, I feel like that helps greatly. Well, you're recognizing that you are a part of her support, right? The system that she has, and that the two of you work together 
towards understanding um, what her needs and concerns are related to it and being able to share your emotions about it. How about you, David? Um, it's a, it's an every, if it's not an everyday thing, it's, uh, at least, uh, 75% of the week, depending on, you know, whether we're together, we're together or not. Um, it's just part of your daily living DNA. It's just, it's, 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 it's not just happening to her. It's happening to us. So, um, I mean, I don't feel, I don't, I don't, I don't physically feel the effects that she goes through. But uh, mentally, I'm right there. I'm right there with her. Um, and uh, it's just, it's just, uh, it's an everyday thing. It's, and it's, 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 it's a no brainer because, uh, well, you know, when you love somebody, it, it's, it's pretty easy to just be with them. And regardless whether it's a good day or it's a bad day, you just, you just, you deal with things as they come up. So you would say that you have some pretty good communication between each other about how each of you are feeling emotionally and how um, the psoriatic disease influences the emotions of, of both of you. Yes, a a absolutely. Uh, some some days you just well, it's it, it's a it's a worse day than normal. Uh, you just kind of relax and maybe uh, catch a movie on TV if we can do that. Watch a little bit of TV at nighttime, and in other days it's. Uh, it's go, go, go. Yeah. Uh, so, time yeah. for the TV. We'll definitely watch something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, another question I have is how do you deal with the frustration and burnout um, while you're trying to manage your own emotions? Hmm. Well, in my case, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of the music community in the Pittsburgh tri-state area. So I'm involved with a couple different, different, uh, music bands. So I guess when I get together with regardless of whatever whichever whichever band it is, um, you know, I might be able to work out some of my my frustration there as to just like running through a couple songs. Um, but uh, that's my outlet is my outlet is music. Okay. Well that's good because that's also a part of self care. So yes. very much so. And yeah. so um, Raymond? Um, I, we try to find something we both enjoy to do. Like, uh, once football season comes around, we'll sit there and watch, uh, watch my Rams play and lose. Uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, find something common to do, like something where we both can enjoy something to do, uh, just to, you know, forget about the world for a couple of hours before we're up and going again. I mean, if you can find a common interest or, uh, do it, you know, it's, if it's, Fun for you guys, do it. And so that's what I say, you know. So pretty much um, you have a outlet and a strategy to to manage those frustrations and to prevent. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, fatigue is also uh, a big part, plays uh, a part in uh, psoriatic uh, diseases. Um, do you take time? How do you take time to listen to your partner to make sure to learn what their their language is in expressing the um, concerns and their uh, emotions related to their condition? Uh, in, in our case, um, I work remotely from home, so I have a little bit easier access to Tammy than Ray does for in the day with Jen. Um, so it could be anything from sitting down in the morning, having a cup of coffee and just talking about how, how, how things are going, how you're feeling that day. Um, and it can also happen again around lunchtime. And then, and then after I fin finish work, I, I definitely have, I have more access to Tammy than like I said, uh, Ray does with Jen because they're, they're two ships passing in the night sometimes. <laughs> you know? Right. So with Tammy and I, we probably have, we have more opportunity face to face to be able to uh, talk talk to one another about uh, how things are going, how we're feeling, what we're thinking during the day. Well, sometimes there are um, people don't want to talk about and express when they are experiencing pain. And how do you work around that? Do you find that you have a good communication about? 
expressing, knowing when um, the fatigue is becoming um, a big problem. I, I can I can see it in Tammy's eyes. Her eyes her eyes give it away. Okay, and I'm, it, it's probably it's, it might be pretty similar with Ray and Jen. Right, it's it's a you just look at them, you know you just look and you're like okay, here we go. What's going on today? Kind of a thing. So like I said, it's uh it's uh it's just it's something that we're used to because we're together and uh, and there's and I mean nothing is not, not no secrets nothing is sacred. <laughs> it's just right. Just lay it all out there. Raymond, do you have something to add to that? Right. Well, you know, anything that can help her feel comfortable because she's going through some kind of pain or whatever, where I mean, a little neck rub, maybe a back rub, something where she could relieve that that stress and that pain. Um, I, I'll do. You know, um, if she lets me know what's what's you know what's hurting, what anything, I, I'll do what I can to make her feel comfortable. Okay. Yeah. So it seems that both of you seem to have a a relationship um, that has been circled around the fact of psoriatic d disease and your your wife's conditions. Correct. Yes. Yep. Uh, so it seems that within itself, you have a support group within a support network, which the NPF provides. Sounds about right. Yes. Okay, good, yeah. good. So it becomes a larger family so that um, it's about uh, that advocacy and the fact of being involved and empowering your, your um partners as well as learning more for yourself in how to be a supportive partner for someone living with psoriatic disease. Absolutely. Well, we have um, another um, question related to um, how involved are you with um, your partner's um, dermatological um, appointments? Do you help them out with possibly making a list to talk about what they need to with their provider and a guide, or? Um, in, in in our case, Tammy has, I mean, she has everything down down to a T. So I don't I, I don't exactly like make a list of things because I don't think I could think of anything other than what she has already written down or things that she's already asked her, her doctors. Um, so I end up, I end up finding out, I end up learning through stuff that she's gone through with the doctor and additional questions that she might have for the next, for the next appointment. I, uh, I don't think I can think of anything that would be any more intelligent about it or prolific about it than what, 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 what Tammy has already noted for her doctors. So um, in that respect, I'm, I'm just there for support, really. Okay. Raymond, you said that you had gotten used to also maybe helping with some of the injections of the biologics. Yeah. Um, do you um, do anything with her as far as going to maybe any appointments or other than just, you know, very much, you know, those injections can be um, kind of difficult to, to give uh, to someone else, let alone yourself, but right. uh, you know that fear. Yeah, I had to, I had to get over that fear real quick there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, she, she actually, um, well, she looks. She uh, goes to a rheumatologist, not a, not a. Uh, what was it? Rheumatologist. rheumatologist. Right. So you know, she she knows uh, being a nurse and all that stuff herself. She knows what to ask and everything like that. So I can't add anything to that. Um, all I could do is be there to listen to what, or, and ask her what the doctor says and anything of that nature. And with the helping with the medication and stuff like that, that was just a no brainer to me. She didn't want to do it one day and she asked me to do it. And, you know, it scared me to have to death to having to put a needle in her, but I didn't want to hurt her, but she's like, you're not going to hurt me. So I went ahead and did it. <laughs> I had to get over it. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, you can definitely empathize in the fact of, you know, how these injections are are given and that, um, you know, the, the various techniques and everything. So 
Um, so what do you do to um, stay informed about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Uh, NPF all the way. That's the, yeah. that, that's the source I use. I mean, 100%. Yeah. Yes. And so I heard that basically this partner panel was basically something that the two of you were very interested in having brought out within the conference and the fact of not just the person that has psoriasis and psoriatic disease, but also anyone that is a loved one or a care partner that it doesn't mean that that person is alone in feeling the pain even though they're the ones with the condition but you as being spouses it greatly impacts when you see a pay, one of your partners in pain and dealing with this condition that um, has a, a great impact on them emotionally so um anything that you might add to that i i think the last conference that we were we were all part of i mean i, I think uh raymond and i almost looked at each I, we, we like looked at each other and we said wouldn't it be really cool if we did something like this <laughs> we actually right. came up i mean we were thinking about it the same thing we we we, we looked and because we were sitting at the same table and we we expressed what we were thinking Different words, but the same results. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know, as, as you know, and, and here we are to this day. Um, and we had then mentioned it uh, um, to Audrey, and she said, "Wow, that would be a fat. That's a fabulous idea." And we're like, "Wow, we came up with a good idea How about that." <laughs> you know, so right. um, you know, it's because uh, all <laughs> when when you have somebody who's willing to. Um, go beyond their boundaries and and and, expl and talk about what their partner goes through right of which other folks already know this but they see somebody sometimes all you need is a couple people to step forward and, and say a few things first and then it's like you know then they'll tell they'll tell they'll, they'll tell two friends and then they'll tell two friends like that that Claire all commercial year, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. years ago, <laughs> and it, it, it opens it up for the, it, it'll open it up for the community. It could open it up to somebody else, maybe just one other person who would want to, who would want to be part of something like this. Maybe the next time this takes place, uh, or maybe multiple people will eventually uh, feel more comfortable with diving in. As um, not that Raymond and I are pioneers by any stretch of the imagination, but we. Right. Hopefully, we this got this started and continues on, um, and involves more people, more folks that want to come forward to talk about, you know, supporting and caring for their for their loved one who suffers from psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Right. So, how would you, if we were to ask your your wives, how would they um, say that you have made a difference? in how they deal with their uh, psoriatic disease by the fact of your empowerment and support. I know, I know Tammy is, uh, um, she's very well happy that I'm, that I embrace this. I mean, she's, uh, and happy might not be the right word. I'm not using the right word, but, right. Um, she, but she doesn't, what, you know, what I'm able to say or what I'm able to do for her means that she doesn't feel alone. I think that's one of the key takeaways from that is that by your uh, advocacy empowerment, aw. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a good <laughs> approval. <laughs> so that, uh, that you have mutually um, done a great deal for each other by being supportive. How about yeah. you, Ryan? Oh, same here. You know, just uh, you know, she'll tell me she appreciate appreciates what I do and things like that. She knows it's not uh, an easy thing to go through, uh, but I, you know, I do what I can. It's just, you know, something that's in me. Like like uh, Dave said, you know, if you're if you love somebody that deeply, you're just gonna do whatever it takes to 
uh, alleviate any type of pain that they're going through. Well, that's true. Now, what would you say to anyone that is just finding out about a partner having psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis and that what could you give to that care partner to tell them how you can be of help to your person? Uh, my thing would be um, keep your mouth shut and listen. A lot of men tend to like to talk over people. You can be quiet for five minutes and listen to your partner and what they're telling you. You know how to take care of things. Well said. Yeah. Yes. Listen. Look, yeah, yeah, just uh, listen um, and uh, be patient. Right. I mean, and and because then when you when you when you get to learn what's going on, then uh, I mean, I believe when you love somebody, you're gonna you're gonna it, it's just it's all gonna fall into place. But like Raymond said, just uh, listen and uh, and just uh, take it all in before you process it and then use your own words to support from there. Well, that's very important. Now, do we have any questions? Anything else you might want to add to our listeners? You know, I can't, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> do you have any tips other than you discussed um, the fact of, of listening and also, Raymond, about your mouth shut? So, and, and listen. <laughs> right. So, what other tips um, can you offer about communication? Uh, yeah, I think uh, when you realize there's uh, uh, more than just you out there, you'll you'll figure it out. You know, um, uh, if you put yourself away and just let things happen the way it should happen, it's going to work out. That's yeah, you have to you have to have an open mind uh, and and uh, just be support supportive and pay and, and patient because it's 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 not about you, it's about your loved one. Well, it seems that uh, both of you have a great deal of um, compassion and empathy for your partners and that you have been able to be so supportive of them during this time. Now, um, I was wondering if there are any um, questions from the um, other participants for our gentlemen. Okay, it looks like we oh, do have oh, yeah. uh, what's what's the hardest part of loving a woman with PSA? I, I don't I don't find it difficult at all for the love and support that I, I have and I, I, I give to Tammy. I I I'm not gonna speak for Ray, but I I would think that he probably feels the same way. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. That's wonderful. We have another one that says, How do you help deal with the fear that can come from living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, none of this, none of this scares me. I, I it's, it's just, it's just uh, what we live with every, every day, and you deal with whatever happens, whatever comes down, comes down the road. Um, yeah, there's, um, I, I don't, I don't fear anything. No. Right. And, and, you know, for me, it was just, it, it took me a minute to to learn and realize what, what was going on with the uh, psoriatic arthritis. After that, it just came natural to me on how to uh, look for certain things, like in the body language of my of Jennifer and stuff like that, to realize what's going on. Okay. We have someone that says that they don't have a question, but state... Um, I have a unique perspective because I have PSA and PSO, but also am a caretaker for my wife who has multiple autoimmune diseases. So what would you say to this person? Um, 
Well, I, uh, I, I think it's as, as much love and compassion that Raymond and I have for Jen and, and Tammy that, uh, Matt, Matt, Matthew, who we both know is, uh, he's an amazing man and he's, he's a pretty awesome guy. And, um, you know, and, and I, I've, I've learned from Matt about, about the disease as on, on, the, on the support side. Um, and I met Matt, uh, in, in, at the Chicago conference, which was what, I don't know, four years ago or something like that now. But, uh, and, uh, you know, we, you know, you're, as you're meeting everybody at those events, you're talking about anything and everything. And Matt pulled me aside and, and, and he asked me, and how are you doing? You know, and I was like, I, I was the first that I, I, that I, uh, that anybody had actually asked, uh, you know, asked me that, um, in that context. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Why? <laughs> He's like, well, you know, you, that's, that's everybody's first reaction. I'm yeah, all right. You're gonna, you're gonna, <laughs> I'm fine. He says, you're, you know, you know, you, you matter too. And, um, so, so I've learned, I've learned a lot from Matt and, uh, I, I appreciate his kind words. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he has uh, more love and compassion for most people than, than other than, uh, you know, other, other than Tammy and Jen do. I, I don't know anybody else who has that, that, that kind of love and compassion for many, many people, just people in general. So yeah, Matt's a great guy. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> yes, well, it seems again, there is a, a great um, connection and um, family connection, brotherhood to a lot of you that are supporting um, spouses and supporting each other uh, in regards to this. So is there anything else that you have any advice for anyone um, in general about caring for someone that has psoriatic disease? You want to go first, Ray? Well, my one thing is just stay strong for the both of you. There's going to be times where it's going to be tested. Uh, you just keep your nose up and you keep walking forward and you'll find that that uh, that ending line or the beginning line or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, just stay strong for the both and you'll you'll get to your uh, where you need to be. Yep. Yep. He nailed it. Be patient. Everything else, will, everything else will just fall into place. Well, do you feel that you have been able to express all the things that you wanted to share at this conference to others? I, I, I would say yes. I would say yes. I mean, because it, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it involves love and compassion and, and patience and uh, communication. That's. Uh, I guess those are the four corners, but if you have that established, everything else should be relatively easy, uh, easy in a different kind of definition. Right. Depending on how the day is going, but yeah. Okay. So, um, hey, I Mary, just to mention that Alan, uh, this is Audrey, Alan, uh, we lost him. So uh, Renee's going to hop in now and just kind of wrap up. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you so much for this awesome panel. It's really good to hear, you know, the other side of the story, I suppose. You know, not just people with the disease, but the people who love them. So, again, thank you so much for being on. And for our next segment, um, we have Kathleen Gallant, who was elected to the Board of Directors in 2006 and currently serves as the board's ex officio International Federation of Psoriasis Associations representative. Kathleen has had psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis since her early teen years and has been a member of the NPF since 1993. She's going to share an exciting update about the World Psoriasis Day. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Good, because I took my video off. I don't like to watch myself while I'm talking. <laughs> so hi, so thank you so much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about World Psoriasis Day. Each year, the global psoriatic community unites together to connect 
to spread awareness and education around October 29th, World Psoriasis Day, led by IFPA, which is the International Federation of Psoriasis Associations, of whom I serve on the board. We choose a theme each year that can help everyone speak for our community and drive political action. Being a federation of national associations, we have to try to choose a theme and suggest actions that everyone in around, around the world can use, regardless of where they live or the size of the organization that they may have. In addition, we try to align where possible to what's going on with the global health movement and the World Health Organization, what they're focusing on and amplifying, because we kind of piggyback on that, it can strengthen our own messaging and actions. This year, um, the main focus of the WHO and the global health movement in the non-communicable disease category, which psoriatic disease is under, is universal health coverage. And that's symbolized by the umbrella where you, you see um, the orange umbrella on the screen. Universal health coverage means that all people have access to the full range of quality health services that they need when and where they need them without financial hardship. So a basic need means regardless of where you live, you have access to what you need. And in terms of psoriatic disease, it's information, support, healthcare, uh, specialists, and any treatment, and the best treatment where you live. So we hope this theme will help anyone, especially our member organizations and all stakeholders, achieve what they need this year. So on October 29th, the global community um, unites for action. So we hope you join us. So um, this is what we have to offer. If you, you're interested, you can go to our website for psoriasis day at the bottom, and you could use any of these um, templates for your social media action. And also you'll be hearing in a bit from Dana, just a minute or two about what you can do within the US to be involved in the National Psoriasis Foundation's World Psoriasis Day campaign. So I thought you might wanna see some faces of our community around the world, even though this is from last year, these are some of the activities that were going on. You could see from the Netherlands and Hong Kong, Singapore, Germany, Malaysia, Russia, these are all faces of, of people just like you that are going out and they're advocating for whatever they need in their country. A lot of the times it's just awareness from the public, from healthcare providers. This is what psoriasis is. This is what I go through. Here's another picture um, from Peru, Dominican Republic, France. Again, this is this is our community all over the world, and we all we're all going after and struggling with the same things and we're just one big community and and our voices matter so we have greece i like the picture from greece it tells me things are looking up <laughs> so um i'll be interested to see what they do this year uh, this is just one last thing from the ifpa ambassadors which are patients from around the world which have all types of psoriatic disease and um, this is something that they did for world psoriasis day last year in conjunction with mental health and so um, i'll be interested to see what they'll be posting all weekend and so if you go to the world psoriasis day website you can see a heat map of the world and you can click on the pins that are there where, all, where organizations and individuals and medical societies have started to upload their activities and you can click on them. And just to give you an example about some of the things that are happening, a few days ago, the Argentine Association held an annual Congress called Psoriatica, where they had more than 2,400 attendees. Malaysia commemorated World Psoriasis Day with children activities, specialists talks, photography exhibition, skin consultations, and a dance performance. Sorphil in the Philippines will host a fun walk tomorrow. They have a free skin and bone clinic. They have a patient art exhibit, and they have this fun contest where somebody's going to get an award for the most festive umbrella. In Greece, um, Epidermia will hold events in the public square of Athens. In Nairobi this morning, in Kenya, they held a World Psoriasis Day Symposium where they call themselves the Psoriatic Disease Warriors, met with families and doctors and discussed issues of access. And also tomorrow's live streaming on Facebook, I think starting around 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 
Um, there will be um, live messages from World to Rise this day from people all over the world, including my board. I could go on and on highlighting all the wonderful things our community does, but I just wanted you to see a little snapshot, and I hope that you get involved. And just I want to thank you. This is a picture of our secretariat in Stockholm, acting crazy. They're great, great people working really hard for all of us. So thank you, and um, I hope you have a great World to Rise this day. Thank you so much for all that. It's so cool to see what's happening around the world with uh, World Psoriasis Day. And then next we'll have, um, from Dana Berry, we'll have her present this slide and give us some more awesome information. Yeah, so I'm happy to tell you about what NPF is doing for World Psoriasis Day. Each year we join with IFPA in celebrating and recognizing the 125 million people worldwide. And what we really wanna do this year is listen to you. We want to know what is psoriasis to you? How does it impact your life? What does it look like on your skin? And what is unique about living with psoriasis in your country, wherever you are? Because when we celebrate our differences and honor our shared experiences, we strengthen this worldwide community. So take a photo, a video, jot down your story, create a work of art, and then post it on Instagram and use the hashtag, this is psoriasis. And be sure to tag us. The information is on the screen. And uh, have a really fantastic World Psoriasis Day tomorrow. All right, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for attending this Healthier Together, the Whole Body Health Community Conference. Before we wrap up the day, just a few items to mention. This conference has been recorded and it will be available on the NPF website soon. Please consider volunteering with the NPF. Deepen your connections to NPF and the psoriatic disease community. And they will also be sending out a survey next week. We want to know your thoughts about the conference today, and we'd love to hear back from you. And also, just as a um, another reference point, all of the, the different documents and everything that was referenced in the chat session, those will be available uh, for you as well. So keep that in mind, and that concludes today's conference. Thank you for attending.